it's not a difficult thing to enter into the presence of the Lord because he's so, he's so eager. It's all his idea. <laughs> he's looking for somebody that he would uh, be allowed to fully reveal himself through. I mean, that's what the Bible is all about. That's the Word of God is all about. I mean, he created Adam as image and his likeness, breathed in his breath, his nostrils, the breath of life, made him a living soul so that he could express all of his glory and his presence through a man. Huh? It's pretty amazing, isn't it? And then we see now in these days, in these last days, this opportunity for you and I to be able to walk into a place in his presence, being baptized in the Holy Ghost and fire. And, you know, when we begin to sing, that's all we're asking God to do. We're praying. We're not, I'm not, I'm, listen, if you look for different results in, in the things they do, I want, you to, I want you to begin to move in faith and be, begin to move in miracle power that as you pray, God will answer. All songs are supposed to be as prayer set to music. That's it. It's just prayer set to music. That's what praise is. It's the giving of thanks. It's the petitioning. It's the acknowledgement of God. It's the interaction with him. The individual personal interaction with him set to music. Now, I want you to understand this. Fundamentally, worship is defined in bringing a sacrifice, putting it on an altar, lighting it on fire. Well, Father lit it on fire from heaven and then it being turned into smoke, and there is an ascent offering. And so when you see, remember Manoah, the son of Manoah? You remember who the son of Manoah is, right? Samson. And so when he was offering an offering before the Lord, right? And then the angel, you know, consumed it with the fire, and then what did the angel do? The angel ascended up in the flames of it up into heaven. So, you know, first of all, he's standing there looking at a person who looks like a man. His face is glowing with radiant power. He's going, who on earth? What is going on? Surely we're going to die. You know, his wife talks him off, uh, off the edge, right? Say, look, you know, why would we die if he's coming to tell us that we're going to have a child and he's going to be great? I mean, come on. You know, guys are sometimes, well, you're stuck in religion because it was a folklore thing. If you saw an angel, you would die. So you're just stuck in religion. But at any rate, when we began to worship the Lord, Reality of it is, is people need to get their faith directed in a different direction. There's a lot of cr crazy things crept in the church in the 1960s and the 1970s. Somebody said, I'm a throwback to the 1500s. No, no, I'm, I'm a throwback to the zeros. I mean, to, I'm talking about the 30s. I'm talking about the days of Jesus Christ. That's, such, that's what set the calendar. A.D., you know, that's the zeros, right? All the way back to the days of Jesus. Don't, st don't set me down in the 1500s. I'm, I'm really interested in ultimately doing what God says to do and getting his results. And, uh, you know, you come, somebody said, well, are you Calvinist or Arminius? Armenian, I'm neither. And anybody who follows me is also neither. We're neither Calvinist nor Armenian. You are either, truly, you are either a person who is espoused to Christian philosophy or you're a Word of God person. I'm a Word of God person. So therefore, I mean, I believe that everything that God said in His Word is all about you and I submitting ourselves to Him so He can come and fill us up fully and do all of His good pleasure through our life so that we can have everything that He's purposed man to have when He created Him in His image and His likeness. So because, because when you look in Genesis chapter 1, you see God creating man in his image and his likeness, right? And then when you look at Ephesians chapter 4, you see that God recreated man after righteousness and true holiness in his image and his likeness, okay? So there is a, there's a, you know, we had a bit of a, a break between the, 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 the initial event with Adam and his transgression and sin, but then Christ Jesus came and he did a work for us so that we could step back in. Now listen, I want to help you understand something. Many people who basically are over here in this category of Christian philosophy, they don't recognize that what Jesus did has far greater impact on man than what Adam did. Romans chapter 5 is devoted to, the, uh, to addressing the subject. People still think, oh, you know, Adam's sin is so powerful and so weighty. Who can live a day without sin? I mean, somebody's like, you know, you got to be crazy, man, if you think somebody can live a day without sin. Have you ever late, lived a day baptized in the glory of the Holy Spirit? Have you ever lived a day filled up with the glory of God? Now, if you would just live one day filled up with the glory of God, you'll see what I mean. See, there is a realm in which you can step into, but you're going to have to come out from the world. You're going to have to quit engaging the world. You're going to have to quit engaging the things that demon spirits are propagating through the earth. The same person and the same realm that propagated lies and, and propagated disobedience during the days of Adam 
propagating them right now. And literally, um, you know, Paul defines them as the spirits of disobedience, okay? And, and, and when we read in Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 6, I want you to listen to me very carefully because you could take notes. If you've got a photographic memory, no problem. Don't need to take notes. But bottom line of it, is, and we got a tape too, so that kind of helps you as well. And of course, if you already know the scripture, then fine, you've already got it established. But you listen to me very carefully because I'm not giving you Christian philosophy. I'm saying you're not Armenian or you're not, you're not Calvinist. You're either you're either Christian philosophy people or you're the Word of God people. So I'm going to give you the Word of God. I'm not going to give you Christian philosophy. I'm not going to, by the help and the grace of God, I'm not going to mix the two because if I did, most people don't even have enough biblical understanding and established enough of the Word to discern the two, okay? So I want you to hang with me. Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 6. <laughs> Paul says, let no man deceive you with vain words, for because of these things comes the wrath of God upon the children of disobedience. Okay, I want you to listen to this. And he's saying, he, li- he lays out everything that belongs to the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, and the pride of life. <laughs> John goes on to say, and, and here's another witness, and, and of course, people say, ah, oh, you don't know the difference between the law and grace. Well, I'm, John knew the difference between the law and grace. He introduced the difference between the law and grace in John 1, 17. He said the law came by Moses, but grace and truth by Jesus Christ. So the same apostle, the same man that said that, said in 1 John 3, 7, let nobody deceive you. Don't be deceived. He that does righteousness is righteous even as he is righteous, and he that sins is of the devil. Is that pretty plain? Oh, that's really plain. Somebody goes, oh, no, 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 no. Go back to 1 John 1, 8. 1 John 1, 8, it says, if you say you haven't sinned, then you make God a liar. And you know, and and you can't say that you haven't sinned. Well, nobody's saying that we haven't sinned. We have sinned. And praise God for the blood of Jesus Christ that washes us from all sin. And and praise God for the the, the fact that we can confess our sin in verse 9. And that he is faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us from all sin. But when we think about the grace and truth that came by Jesus, we've got to recognize what that is. You've got to recognize what this is. It is where God changes you, gives you a new heart, gives you a new spirit, makes you a new creation. And then he, he expects that we want to live in heaven. He brings us into a heavenly realm. Colossians 1.13. Listen to me very carefully because this is what people miss. They miss this. God has translated us out of the kingdom of this world and the kingdom of your son so now that we can be trained in the Holy Ghost, not to go back to our former conversation. And here's where it happens. This is where the breakdown happens. We get a new birth. We have a miracle new birth. We get a miracle transformation. And then religion sets in. Ideology set in. Philosophies. Paul said you're going to be spoiled through philosophies and, and through the teachings that belong only to men. Don't be spoiled through these traditions and through these philosophies. God says, I want you to come over here. I'm, I'm going to give you the Holy Spirit. I'm going to give you the Holy Ghost. Jesus said uh, there is a there is a this there is a opportunity, a, a an appointed uh, a, a time, a time and administration is the word I'm looking for right now, where the Holy Spirit is going to be with you and he's going to lead you and he's going to guide you into all truth. But what happens is we turn ourselves aside to a realm in which now we entangle ourselves with the affairs of this life. We include a whole bunch of worldly stuff and we justify it. I mean, you know, isn't it crazy how Saul, God told, you know, you know how exact God, as you've been reading through uh, the scripture now, you're, you know, you basically are into 2 Samuel, and you read through the scripture, you can see how many people justify themselves, right? Look at Saul. Well, God told him very clearly, and there's many times you get examples of this, God told him, kill everything, kill it. She said, I don't understand that. How could that be possible? Because you realize that they are past being saved. It's like a disease. It's worse than the plague. It's worse than Ebola. All they're going to do, they will not turn. They've, it's already been proven. They will not turn. They're, they are fixated upon their idolatry. They will not turn. Therefore, wipe them out. And he told them, he said, look at what, I want you to go after Agag, and I want you to take him out and all that he has, I mean, everything, including sheep and oxen, everything. I want it all put to the, put to the sword. And uh, so what did Saul do? He said, well, you know, he, he kept Agag alive and he kept the best of the sheep and the oxen alive. And then Samuel goes, comes along and says, what are you doing? He said, well, you know, I'm going to keep the best so we could sacrifice to the Lord. Nonsense. You liar. You know, just all, always trying to find a reason to self-justify. You see that over and again. And you see where Father's position is on it. He goes, nonsense. 
That's, it's nonsense. What is it better to, to you know, sacrifice or to be obedient? And he said, what your problem is, is you don't understand rebellion, that is the sin of witchcraft, that stubbornness. Look at what stubbornness is. Rebellion and stubbornness. What, what it ultimately relates to it, but in, in God's terminology, is nothing more than a defiance on the level of a satanic, the same satanic defiance that Lucifer showed when he rebelled against God. So the reality of it is, sin truly is treason against the kingdom. Now, if you commit treason against the United States of America, what's going to happen? You're going to be, well, n probably nothing going to happen to you now, but you see, something <laughs> bad would happen to you. Commit treason against the People's Republic of China, something's going to happen to you. Okay, you know, and we could go down through the list. Uh, something bad's going to happen to you in most nations if you commit treason. At least here, you probably would go to jail so long as it's verifiable and you don't, you know, you can't afford a really good lawyer. Because if you probably can afford a really good lawyer, you're going to get out of it because now we take the bribe and it perverts judgment and truth. Okay, and we know how Father feels about that. And we have to understand, how do we feel about this? How do we feel? How many pastors who sit in the seat of judgment? People don't know this, but pastors are judges. Apostles are judges. God made us judges in his house. As much as he made judges in the, in the past in the Old Testament, he made us judges now to perfect, <laughs> to say that's wrong and that's right. Uh, and somebody said, well, let's call it a coach. Okay, well, let's call it a coach. Look at how a coach is on you, man. Huh? He's saying, when you're standing wrong, that you're standing wrong. What? Can I even stand right? No. Not and be successful. And we take it. And the Lord's going to show us one day. He's going to show us. He's going to bring us into judgment. And he's going to say, this is how you responded to your professor at school, because you're going to get a grade. And you're looking for you know, a vocation that's going to make good money. And look at how well you paid attention to him. And here's how you responded to your coach, because you wanted to be a star athlete or whatever else. You wanted to make the team. Look at the, look at the, look at the respect. Look at the cooperation and participation you gave him. Now, here's what you did with your pastor. Here's what you did with the visiting evangelist. Because probably you didn't agree with them, but you're not the expert. And reality of it is, the pastor's not the expert. And the evangelist isn't the expert. The gifting is the expert. The anointing is the expert. <laughs> you know, over and again, you can see people, the people of Israel rebel against Moses as though Moses was the one who opened up the earth to swallow up Korah and Dathan. It wasn't Moses' idea for Korah and Dathan to so, act so foolishly in the first place. It was their idea. And then he warned them over and again, you guys are in trouble. I'm telling you, you you're, go, you're taking too much in yourself. But they, went and ref, they refused to repent because men can justify things in their own mind to their own destruction. And the word of God's just shining. And, he, and Father, as a light in a dark place, and Father's saying, you need to humble yourself like a little child. He's looking at us and he said, humble, humble yourself as a little child and be converted. Now, more than likely, what's going to happen here tonight, if everybody's receptive, I know what Father wants to happen. Father wants to happen similar things that happened on last, this past meeting we had on Sunday night, where there is a number of people who have exact words of knowledge for people, things that they're going to have to do if they want to move on with God, okay? And if they want the miracle that God has for them, there's going to be healing in the place. Everybody in this place is going to be allowed to have an encounter with God and feel his manifest presence. Now, you could shut his manifest presence out because you can get in your own head. Isn't it a terrible thing that people would actually live their life after their own judgments? Make up their own mind according to whatever they think. Well, this is what I conclude. And then they go ahead and walk in that. People all the time making decisions. Because decisions is actually an equivalent word for judgments. To decide is to make a judgment. And people are deciding on, all the time. They're going, hmm, well, I'm not going to do that. Or, yes, I am going to do that. And really, the bottom line of it is, most of those decisions, even in the community of the church, isn't a decision that is clearly an instruction of the Word of God and a direction uh, by the Holy Spirit. And just because I'm wanting to give you a review tonight, where were, how, how did the Gibeonites... How did the Gibeonites fool Joshua? Joshua was so anointed. He had all of these men of God around him. How did the Gibeonites fool him? How? One reason. No, they didn't fool him by moldy bread. That's what they used. They used that to fool him. 
they used moldy bread and, and uh, ragged clothes kind of thing and soured wine. But really, how did they fool Joshua and the mighty men who, who God Almighty was right there with them? There's one verse of Scripture that describes how they got fooled. So some of you are shaking your heads now. They sought not the Lord. All they had to do was just stop and don't just stand there and try to figure it out with your own head and your own reasoning. Look, the bread is moldy. I mean, because you can see uh, Joshua is suspicious as soon as he sees the Gibeonites. Where are you guys really from around here? Huh? He was moving on it. But he, he went with it. He went with the idea. He went with the sham. He went with the trickery. All he needed to do was just stop. Say, Father, show us right now. Wow, to step into that kind of faith. This is what we wanted, we, we, this is what we're preaching about. This is what we're ministering about. This is the, the example that we want to show you how to live by the word in such a way you have a personal interaction with the word who was manifested in the flesh and his name is Jesus. This is an opportunity that by and large is simply not being <laughs> received and, and, and not being exercised by and large, in the body of Christ. We're just, we're just trying to bring people over here into a place to where that all of a sudden, you can find a way to live by the word, Jesus Christ. Where Christ Jesus, the word, comes to live on the inside of you. From Genesis 1, 1 to Revelation 22, 21, I'm telling you right now, it's all about Jesus. In one way or the other, it's all about Jesus, a testimony of who he is and what he's going to do for humanity. The word made flesh to come and redeem us. True. Now, wh why, is it, why is it that we don't want to make the switch? Why is it that we, we basically sit around, something bad happens to us, people don't do us right, we don't figure that the situation or circumstance is working out right? What do we do? We make a decision. Based on what? Circumstances. Philosophy. Ideology. Experience. Now listen, if you are here tonight and you are a prisoner of hurt, you have been abused by human beings, you are one um, unfortunate person that hasn't gone through anything that all the rest of us hasn't gone through because everybody goes through the same stuff. The problem is whether or not you've had a counter with the Lord Jesus Christ on a level to where they, that gets washed away, you get cleansed, and now you're able to go ahead and do it his way. And he says when somebody, when somebody uh, curses you, you bless them. When somebody persecutes you, you bless them. He tells us how to respond to every situation. He gives us our final decision and conclusion. When you begin to live by principles, most decisions are already made for you. That you don't have to, it's, it's, there's no more emotion thing. There, there's no more just quick responses. I'm living by the word of God. My decisions are already made for me. I know exactly what I'm going to do. I'm going to find myself right in that place of seeking first the kingdom of God, which is one of the most important principles that has a lot of very uh, personal ap daily applications for your life. And so I want to I take you there right now. I'm going to take you there. In Luke chapter uh, 12, verse 35, I want to take you there. I'm glad you've given yourself to knowing the Word of God. You know that you can read the whole Bible six times a year. And when you, begin to, when you begin to have that kind of fellowship and that kind of relationship, you know what happens to you? No one can, no one can lock you down into some little, you know, unbalanced, twisted idea of, what, of things about God. Because you're reading through the Word of God that much, you start seeing the big picture you know, the folks, you know, the folks that you saw in school who really did well, and you know, you're like, how do you make in those good grades? You know what they you know what was really going on? They were able to stand back and look at the big picture. They weren't lost in the forest. They understood really what the end result was. I mean, we're just trying to get from here to here, okay? Uh, in organic chemistry, everybody just freaks out. Really, it's just moving electrons around. It's not really that hard. You know, it's, it's making something positive and something negative just by the transference of electrons. But, uh, but all of a sudden, people just panic. They go into a fear. Oh, no. You know, look at, the, look at the periodic table. I mean, they're stuck. It's not really that difficult. Honestly, it isn't. When you can back up and you can see where, what's the real big picture here. And it's, it's, it's that way with everything in life. It's that way with the word of God. We need to back up. And when you begin to, if you just begin to read the Bible two times a year, you know, you know how, much time you have to, how much time do you have to spend to read the Bible two times a year? All the way through from Genesis 1-1 to Revelation 
22, 21. How much time? 30 minutes a day. 30 minutes a day. See, what is happening is people are learning their threshold in the Word of God. You might know your threshold of how fast you can run the 440. Okay, but that ain't nothing. You might know your threshold of how many push-ups you can do. You might know your threshold of how steep of a mountain you can go down skiing if we ever get any snow. Whatever. But how about your threshold in the Word of God? Do you know your threshold? Is this something? Is it, is it daily bread? Man shall not live by bread alone. Hello. People are saying all the time, oh, I can't do it. I'm too weak because you don't have any strength, man. You're not eating. You want survival rations. One time, uh, some preachers told me, they said, well, I was, you know, early in life and I was responding, finally responding that I wasn't going to go into medical science, clinical science. I was going to be a preacher and, and uh, I was, you know, warming up to the idea. And so folks are telling me, listen, what you've got to do now is you've got to recognize that you've got to prepare your sermons in such a way that you really feed the sheep because they're not going to eat unless you feed them. The only Bible they're going to get is what coming out of your mouth. And I looked at him and I said, you, are you kidding me? Is that the way you're doing it? I'm not going to do it. I'm going to make people eat. Yeah. I'm going to make, if, 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 my, if my cows aren't eating, I'm going to crawl up on the inside of them and get them fixed. <laughs> because they're going to be dead. They're not going to be healthy. They're not going to produce. Huh? I'm not gonna. Well, they're not eating. I oh, don't worry about them. They'll die pretty soon. <laughs> what kind of what kind of a crazy man would that be? And yet, in the church, because people have made us facilitators, as soon as we start crawling up into the space of the sheep, suddenly we were controlling, controlling. No, we being less than what your coach is. Go tell your coach he's controlling. You know what he's gonna say? Get on another team. You know, right. You had to tell your coach you're controlling. Where you're like, what do I do next? Can, can, is, am I still in line for first drink? What do I need to work on more? Are you with me? Everybody's with me here. Come on now. Let's quit playing pretend. Amen. We need to quit posing on this thing. In Jesus' mighty name. Hallelujah. Dear people, listen. Man doesn't live by bread alone. It's Old Testament. Where is it at? This is good. That makes me feel good. Thy word have I hid in my heart, oh God, that I might not sin against you. Most folks haven't hid nothing there. Huh? Except for where their, you know, where their finances are. No, I, I, want, I want to get over that. I'm, forgive me for just speaking all the negative stuff, but unfortunately there's too much negative stuff going on. Listen, the, the, the sin of stubbornness, the sin of rebellion, which is the Strongest expressions of self, okay? Is it self-worship is idolatry. Me, 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 I want it. You're not serving me. You're not doing it for me. The seat's not soft enough. The sermon's not short enough. Uh, the music's not pretty enough. Uh, come on now. What are we, what's going on here? This is not about, I'm nobody, no, I'm not getting enough love around here, not getting enough recognition. Nobody, you know, really is meeting my personal needs. That's not what this is about. This is about you getting liberated. So you're like, you're so in love, filled with, so in love with him and so filled with his love, you begin to act like him. And he just loves everybody. You know, when you're born, when you're born into this world, all the arrows point in, okay? It's all about M-E. It's all the arrows. It's full. It's, it, it, the, it's a saturation of self-consciousness, okay, and self-interest. But fathers on the other end of the spectrum, all the arrows are pointing out. It's all about everybody else, his love, his grace, his mercy, his goodness, his giving. And he's taking us into a place of spiritual maturity if we're just willing to do it. But most folks are stuck in this, it ain't working out for me. I don't have enough of this. I don't have enough of that. It didn't happen quick enough. And now that's a prison. If you could see that as a prison and then recognize that the pastor's got the key to get you out of the prison. The pastor can show you how not to go back into that prison. You would sit up in your chair and you would smile and you would take notes. If he's preaching to you the word of God, because the pastor doesn't know. He's not some psychologist. He's not some equipped academic counselor. He's, he's equipped with the word of God. And he's declaring the word of God. These things liberate you. Jesus said you'll know the truth and the truth will liberate you. 
Okay, so, so if you're not liberated tonight, I'm telling you right now, it's a, the problem is in an area of truth because a truth that is rejected is a lie received. And if you believe a lie, what will happen to you? You'll be damned. Well, it's not just an eternal damnation and a future damnation. It's a damnation right where you're at, right, right now. It's hell now. It's a, it's, a, it's a prison now. The good news of the Holy Spirit is this. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he's anointed me to proclaim this good news to the poor in spirit, to those who are just, I really want this. I mean, he's anointed me with the ability to bind up the broken in heart. This is the ministry, in other words, of the Holy Spirit <laughs> that he gives to a human being that he personally identifies and says, okay, I want you to do this on my behalf. Now, when that's happening, you got to, you know, my mama said so many times, look, honey, <laughs> you can lead the horse to water, but you can't make him drink. I wish we could. How about if I put more salt out and make it more salty? That's what I'm going to do. I'm going to be salty. I'm going to be very, very salty. By the help and the grace of God, you're going to drink. And when you drink, when you really drink, when you drink, when you drink deeply, what's going to happen? As soon as you begin to drink deeply, when you get really thirsty, I mean, there's a, des a deep desire and need for God, in other words. All of a sudden, there's going to be a moment of an explosion of the power of God, and Jesus likened it to rivers, a, a, a rivers of water coming out of you. And, and that was the only way he could try to express to us how much power and glory of God we would experience. Whoa, whoa, have you ever had a, have you ever had a river? Have you ever had a stream? Can you look back in your life and say, I know a time where the power of God was flowing out of me with such intensity, it was like a water hose or it was like a fire hose, or it was like a, 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 a creek, or it was, like a, it was like a river, or it was like rivers. It was like Niagara Falls and Victoria Falls combined. It was a blast of supernatural power. It was the most amazing thing. All of a sudden, I was turned inside out. My spirit was bigger than my, my physical body. Suddenly, the reality of heaven was more than the reality of earth. God was before me. Jesus at his right hand. I set the Lord before me and at my right hand so that I would not be moved. See, there is a transition there. All of a sudden, these things that Paul was writing, these things that Jesus said, these things that Paul wrote, these things that John wrote, aren't like, wow, I need a theologian to explain this to me. It's rather an experience that you now are reading about that you can say, wow, yep, that happened to me. Or, I want that. Man, if you never have the moment of, I want that, you're never going to get it. Because it's faith, it's the word of God that produces a uh, 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 this wonderful power called faith. And it's faith that results in the miracle. And I read this in the Word, and, and the Lord says these wonderful things. He says to us something that's really easy to pass over if you've been in the church very long. That He says to not just a few, not just the first century church, not just the pa apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers, and leaders. He says, that you can know what is the height, the breadth, the length, the depth with all saints, everybody included, that you can with all saints. How many saints do we have here tonight? Have you been inducted into sainthood? I got inducted and my name was put on the induction sheet. It's called the Lamb's Book of Life. My name was written in the Book of Life. That is where I got inducted into sainthood. Somebody said to me, well, listen, Mark, how can it be that if there's a catching away before the tribulation, how can we read about saints in the book of Revelation? I said to them, well, how long does it take you to become a saint? <laughs> eh? How long? You got to go through catechism. You got to go through four years of college. You got to basically call. What do you got to do? What feats you got to do? No. You call upon the name of the Lord in a moment, an instant, in a twinkling of an eye, a miracle takes place. The Spirit of the Lord comes upon you and changes you and transforms you into another man. How quickly did Saul be, get, receive a new heart? As soon as he was touched with the oil. How quickly did David receive a new heart? Same way. It's just, just the Lord doesn't break it all down as much. But the same thing happened as soon as the anointing oil came upon him, as soon as the Holy Ghost came upon him. The Holy Ghost comes upon us and changes us into a new creation. And it's a beautiful and wonderful thing now 
You know, Father calls us to come over here and be in a place called sanctified or set apart or consecrated. Well, what does that mean? I hear all these, I've, I've read these books on sanctification and gone, my goodness, this was two-thirds Christian philosophy and one-third Bible if you stretch it. I mean, I could count up the scriptures if I just, if I tallied it up from a statistical point of view. I used to love doing biostatistics and ta- calculate it up from a, from a statistical uh, uh, um, you know, point of view, the total number of words. Then it's just like, you know, my goodness, this book on sanctification, 5% of it. Because 5% of it is a reference to a scripture or it is a, word, a scripture. The rest of it is just people interpreting stuff. Look, it's, <laughs> sanctification is really easy to understand. It's where God consecrates us to live the life of Jesus by the Holy Ghost. <laughs> How hard is that? And there you go. You got it from here on out. God made us holy. It's the act of being made sacred. It's the act of being made sacred and the willingness to stay sacred. And that can be only clearly defined, not in any other religious figure, but only in Jesus Christ personally. People always try to understand grace. Well, understand grace by who it came through. It came through Jesus. He's the definition of grace. What did he give us? That's grace. He, he made us a new creation. Paul describes it. How does he describe it in Titus chapter 3, verse 5 and 6? He says that we were washed with the water of regeneration. You can't get more clean than getting regenerated. Because regenerated means you're a new creation. you got a whole new genome. Okay? That is radical, man. Think about it with me just a minute. <laughs> Hallelujah. Washing of water of regeneration, renewing of the Holy Ghost. He said, you are saved. Look at it. It says, you are saved by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit. That's the definition of salvation. I don't need anybody else's definition. I'm going with Paul's. God used him to write two-thirds of the New Testament. Augustine did not write one verse in the Bible. Luther wrote not one verse in the Bible. Calvin wrote not one verse in the Bible. Uh, I can go on. Thomas Aquinas wrote not one word. Justin Martyr, not one word. Clement of Alexandria, not one word. Tatian, not one word. Origen, not one word. Jerome, not one word. You say this, not one word. How many more people do I need to name that becomes the fathers of Christian philosophy? Look, it's just not that complicated. How many of you are really stuck understanding the, the very complex language of the Bible up to this point as you're reading? It just isn't that complicated. It's all, it's, everybody's got to interpret it. Okay, well then how many stones did David pick up? I mean, come on. Give me a break. What was Jesus' mother's name? You know, what was Jesus' father's name? Almighty God. Very good. Okay. <laughs> well, somebody said, well, that needs a little bit of interpretation. No, it's broken down very clearly. <laughs> Joseph was just there to... Be the man in the house. He was the man that God chose to look after his boy. <laughs> Why he grew in wisdom and in knowledge. While he grew having a diet of milk and honey so that he might do something. Learn to choose the good and refuse the evil. Are you in training? To learn to choose the good and refuse the evil? Are you participating? Because that we're following Jesus. We're going to have to understand exactly what is it that we're following. Because he didn't have a music ministry that I know of. And then it's become like this, you know, it's like the jest of yesterday are the superstars and demigods of today. The score jest, the musician. Right? Now they're the superstars. It's crazy cultures of men, the ever-changing preferences and ideas of humanity. God's word doesn't change. He's calling us into a place of knowing him. (laughs) Man, I'm not, not, I listen to somebody say, oh, faith is just as blind. You just can't know. It's like, you know, whatever. No, it isn't. It's relationship with the Lord. It's an encounter. It's an experience. It's something that you get to know. It's the best thing ever happened to you. If the best thing ever happened, if, 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 this, if what you call a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ is not the best and most dramatic and most shocking and most overwhelming thing that has ever happened to you, you haven't encountered him yet. I don't care who blessed you and said you're good or who confirmed you. Only God can confirm The Holy Ghost bears witness with our spirit that we are his sons. God does the confirmation. Hello. We get to be witnesses of that. And, 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 of course, you know, 
then hopefully you allow us to be instructors, teachers, guides, as we participate with the Holy Ghost, who is your personal instructor, guide, mentor, leader, counselor, comforter. Amazing how he goes home with us, how he lives in us, each one of us, how he's come to dwell on the inside of us by giving us his Holy Spirit. So that this Holy Spirit that we have is equal and, and equivalent to His Holy Spirit. And, and so much that we can say that we are the temple of the Holy Ghost. That that Father dwells in us by the Spirit which He's given to us. That the Lord Jesus dwells in us by the Spirit that He's given to us. And not only in us, but around us, baptized in the glory cloud. Somebody said, oh, my, I wish I could have been back there in those days when the glory cloud of God was leading through the wilderness. No, you don't. You'd probably be one of those folks who the earth would have swallowed you up. And you would have went live down into, the, into hell. See, everybody wants to imagine that they Joshua and Caleb, that they Joseph, that they Moses, Moses, that they Joseph, that they Daniels. The reality of it is the way that they live their life is a proof and an evidence of what they really are and what company you belong to. And I purpose to get all of a bunch of people and make you the company of, of Joseph and make you the company of Joshua, make you the company of Caleb, make you the company of, da of Daniel, make you the company of those consecrated to the Lord. Sometimes he preaches too hard. I felt real good before I went over there. And then by the time I left, I felt terrible. Well, yeah, because we're going to make you mad, sad, or glad, according to the words of Jack Cole. My God, what's wrong with you people? As he pulled the cancer off somebody's neck. Or the deaf, a person who was standing there deaf and mute began to speak and hear. And he'd say, well, God's going to make you mad, sad, or glad tonight. You're going to be mad if you're a Pharisee, you're going to be sad if you hear this and you don't want to change. And you'll be glad if you, can, if you know the joyful sound and you're hungry for change. You're hungry for the reality of God. See, Jesus leaves the 99, goes after the one, but he goes after the one that wants to be saved from sin. Not just the one that wants to be saved from hell. People call him folks to salvation. It's time to call people to repentance. Jesus didn't call nobody to salvation. He called them to repentance. John called them to repentance. God calls the prophets to call people to repentance. To change. God has given us a gift, a privilege to change, to be different, to be totally new. He, God, Jesus leaves the 99 to go find somebody who wants to be totally new, not kind of new. Are you with me? Yes. Not, to be, not to be, okay, I got my name written in the book of, he, uh, of, of life so I can live in hell. He wants God to accept them like they are. If God accepted people like they are, then heaven be no different than the hell that folks live in today. God doesn't. God doesn't accept people like they are. He calls them like they are and changes us to be like him. What a privilege. Now, I've got to be all in on a change. And then, then I've got to be willing to be under the authority <laughs> of the Holy Spirit and understand how the Holy Spirit's authority is administrated. How is it executed? And Father makes that real clear. He gave some apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors, some teachers to execute his authority. Okay, he gave some apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors, some teachers for the perfecting or the maturing of the saints. Huh? For the building up, the strengthening, the empowering, the equipping of the body of Christ. For the work of the ministry. What work of the ministry? To do what Jesus did. These, I mean, can you imagine living in the environment that all of the early church got to live in? Everybody around them. They're in a church. Okay, you go to the church. Who's all there? Well, Peter's there. Uh, James has already been killed, but John's there. Huh? Andrew's there. You, you, Paul's there. I mean, got all of these great men of God. 120 was there on the first day, you know, that the power of the Holy Ghost was poured out. And now everybody's moving in faith, signs, wonders, and miracles, so much so that you hear in Mark chapter 16, verse 17, these miracles and these signs follow them that believe. Everybody's doing it. Huh? Everybody, in my name, you cast out devils. What, the power I gave to the 12, I've given to everybody. The authority I gave to the 70 also, I've given to everybody. In my name, you speak with new tongues. Hallelujah. Praise the name of the Lord Jesus. People are afraid of tongues. Why? Because the atmosphere is afraid of tongues. The prince of the power of the air is afraid of tongues because that's how we hook up with the Holy Ghost. That's one of the primary ways that the teacher shows us how to get our heart, mind, and, 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 and mouth into a realm that is called miracle or heavenly. 
That's how he did it. Jesus said this, Jesus, when he talked about these unlimited expressions of God's glory, what did he liken it to? John chapter, uh, John chapter 7, verse 39, he said, This spake he of the Holy Ghost, because the Holy Spirit was not yet given, for he was not yet glorified. Acts 2.33, what does it say? Jesus now, being received up in heaven, exalted and glorified, has poured forth that which you both see and hear. What did they see and hear? So ultimately, the expression found its, its beginnings in, this, in these Holy Ghost utterances that 3,000 plus people can all hear 120 at the same time doing this and hear in their own language them glorifying God, declaring his wonderful works. You know, that's a miracle. Because you could do that in modern times if everybody's got a translation device. But if you've got 120 people all speaking at the same time, Come on. Even if they were saying the same thing but were just a little bit off in the, in, in the structure of how they were saying it and the cadence of how they were, you know, <laughs> speaking the sentence, nobody's going to understand us. He said, you'd be going saying, quiet down. Let one person talk so we can understand what's being said. But 120 is all in this Holy Ghost realm, and a miracle takes place so that everybody could hear in their own language what they were saying. God created a miracle interpretation. Now, people don't know anything about the miracle, don't know anything about the language. are going to come up with some crazy idea. It doesn't make any sense if you try to put it into true practice. I say to these folks who say that these things happen, I say, why don't you create yourself a model and see if your hypothesis will work? Get yourself 3,000 people out there. Get you 120 people all shouting in, in 12 different languages. And see if any of the 3,000 people plus out there can hear anything. Uh, nobody can hear anything or understand anything. Because it's a miracle. God, people are always asking, well, how did God do it? He did it by miracle. How did God, how did God create everything? Create everything. Miracle. How did God, how can God be eternal? It's a miracle. Every question you got about God's a miracle. Because he is a miracle. And the only way you can describe it is a miracle from our reference point. So it's just time you and I just start living a miracle life. God said, come follow me. I'm going to give you a miracle new birth so you can be like me. I'm going to give you a miracle ministry, but you got to be willing to learn how to walk in it. you got to participate with what the Holy Spirit's doing. If you don't listen to what the te- if you checked out, if you, just, if you come into the classroom, you put your head on the desk and you go to sleep, you're failing this class. Okay, if you sit there and you argue and say, I don't believe it works that way, you fail in this class. It's just that way. If you don't do what the book says, you're going to fail the class. <laughs> and God in his mercy and his grace is such a long-suffering teacher. He's like with a really slow, you know, a bad off learning disability handicap, you and me. He's like, okay, come on, we can do this. One little step, baby, just one little step. Just stand up. Come on, you can do it. 20 years later, I promise you, if you will stand up. He's long-suffering. What happens if we say, wait a minute, I'm all in. I'm going to do this. I'm going to, believe, I'm going to be like a little child. I'm going to be converted. I'm going to become like a little child. I'm going to believe exactly what you said. I'm going to do it your way. Huh? I'm going to step out there. I'm going to lay hands on sick. When I see some demon power messing with folks, I'm going to say, get out of here. More than that, how about this? When you start off, you know, somebody told us about this really good movie to watch, this new Disney movie. I turned it on and I said, ugh. Literally, my spirit was grieved. This is dark. This is demonic. And I, I, you know, I'm, I'm trying to see any good thing. I, I, I just, I turned the person I was with and said, I just can't watch this. Why? Because it's, uh, you're supposed to be it's somehow enjoying this stuff, right? And if you're sitting there aching, why do it to yourself? Why? Because I've learned to choose good and refuse the evil. I'm, I, I love fellowshipping with the Holy Ghost. He's made my heart sensitive to him. I don't like the fear realm. I don't like the dark realm. I don't like demon things. I don't like lasciviousness. I, I, listen, my being could be drawn on those kinds of things, lasciviousness, which is basically the handwriting of it's all over every movie. I could be drawn into that. My, my soul and spirit could be excited by that. I won't let it. Because I know that, wait, that's a totally different realm from me. I can feel that realm. That's a contrary to who I am and what I want to feel. God, forgive me. 
You know, I'm like many times when I'm in certain situations where I'm, you know, visiting other people and they got stuff on, I'm like, Lord, forgive us. Lord God, have mercy upon those people. This stuff is right out of hell. And yet, and yet I know, I know, I know the Spirit of the Lord has told me. I was, I was in a situation one time and I was just basically reviewing and, you know what's what's out there like HBO and Sin, Sin to the Max and some of these others Cinemax uh-huh. okay but anyway I'm like I'm going Lord Jesus who would this is so corrupt and the Spirit of the Lord said my people everywhere are consumed by it well no wonder they know nothing about living in righteousness and purity no wonder they say they're professional sinners no wonder they say oh there's none righteous no not one they've all unrighteous well actually what john what paul is referring to in romans chapter 3 he's taking from the situation that the psalmist is declaring where the people of god had become so rebellious that they had an incurable wound and now god all he could do is to give them a letter of divorcement and turn them over to their enemies so actually they're prophesying out of their own mouth the state of their spiritual uh, situation and folks have no discernment they can't even, they can't even understand wait a minute you're prophesying that you are in the same state of those whom God gave over to their enemies <laughs> because with the heart man believes unto righteousness <laughs> not does this, Romans 10 9 and 10 doesn't say with the heart man believes unto unrighteousness huh so with the heart man believes unto righteousness because that is a, okay it, 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 with the heart man believes unto righteousness with the mouth confession is made unto salvation okay we were called to repentance we received the gift of repentance we received the miracle of salvation through the gift of repentance we said lord i don't want sin in my life i want to learn to walk with you i want to be taught how to walk in the ways of righteousness for your namesake i want to learn what it means to live in 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 your ways to conduct myself in a fashion that is pleasing unto you he says, okay, here, I'm going to give you a miracle. I'm going to give you a heart to understand. I'm going to, give a, I'm going to give you a spirit to be able to yield to me and know me. And now here I am. I'm going to bring all the beauty of my love. I'm going to bring all the beauty of my joy. I'm going to bring all the beauty of my peace, all the goodness, all the stuff that I have. And come on, go with me. Amen. And it would be great if we just continued on with them. Come on, I'm taking the Lord's just taking us, you know, just taking face to face, taking us right on into glory to deeper depths. And what happens is along the way, there's all these distractions where Satan, the enemy of our soul, has laid snares for our feet. I'm saying, I, I cry out to God, oh, Father, only you can see these snares that the enemy has laid for my feet. Oh, God, I thank you that you deliver me so that there's no possibility for my foot to slip and be snared. But it's an act of confession. Okay, Lord, show me what's happening right now. Show me what I'm going to be, what you have of my life, want from my life today. Father, take me, lead me. Lead me not into temptation, but deliver me from evil. Lead me into all your ways. I want to participate. I don't know that God's people wake up like that in the morning. I'm afraid that God's people wake up. Man, I, I got to get to work. I got to go quickly. Why isn't the breakfast done? You know, and then when we get home tonight, we've got to rush off because, you know, it's, it's Black Friday. <laughs> or whatever. And the Lord Jesus says to us by his servant, Paul, he says, come out from among them, be ye separate, says God, and touch not, touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you, and I will be a God to you, and you'll be my people. And somebody said, well, that was the scripture God gave for the Amish. <laughs> no. That's the scripture that God gave to every one of us. <laughs> that isn't an Amish verse for Amish people only. Uh, uh, and somebody said, oh, that's Old Testament. No, it's 2 Corinthians chapter 6, right? Verse 17. We, look, come on, dear people. It's time for a change, okay? It's time to just say, wait a minute. I'm going to settle down here. I'm going to understand. I have, I'm going to have a diet of milk and honey. What's milk and honey? The sincere milk of the word that you may uh, grow thereby. Uh, your law is, your word is sweeter than honey and the honeycomb. Those are expressions about a strong diet of hearing what Father has to say and being willing to do it. Because he gives us the abilities. He tells us, you know, devil, bad. God, good. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> he makes it really very, very simple. He tells, us, he tells us to resist the devil. 
steadfast in the faith. And then tells us exactly what Satan is doing in his demonic realm. But first of all, he's telling us to submit ourselves to him. Now, I want you to turn now with me. In, in view of all of this, in view of the fact that you are <clears throat> consecrated, set apart, holy vessels, inducted into sainthood through the miracle of the new birth when your name was written in the Lamb's book of life. Now to be taught of God, to walk around with the glory cloud of heaven over top you, all around you. In other words, to be baptized in the spirit of holiness or the Holy Spirit because it means the same thing in both the Hebrew language and the Greek language. You may, trans you may translate it Holy Spirit or Spirit of Holiness in both languages. And, and if you'd like for me to, to um, you know, entertain you, I can speak both of them for you. But, you know, I, I'm sure that you can get by without that tonight. And just trust me that I'm telling you the truth, okay? God's baptized us in his glory. He's baptized us in his presence. And, and people get lost in, the, in terminology and semantics because they don't even understand what holiness is. What is holiness? It's what you experience when you stand in front of God. God said to Moses, take off your shoes. You're on holy ground. It's what you experience when you stand in the presence of God. There's no definition for it outside the holies of holies. It's defined where the seraphims are totally freaking out. Are you listening to me? Turn me up. Nobody can hear me. Yes. They're freaking out. They're going, ah, holy, ah, holy. And with two, <laughs> two wings, they, they cover their face. And two wings, they cover their feet. And with two wings, they do fly. I mean, they're not just sitting around going, holy, holy, holy. They're not doing that. The two wings, they fly. I had a vision of it. The Lord showed me, took me in heaven to show me. And it was radical because <laughs> Father wants us to be radical. He wants, he wants us to move beyond all the things that we've been taught by man to do. And now let the Holy Spirit, I'm telling you, when the Spirit of the Lord I, I dance, but I dance when the anointing comes upon me to dance. When the Spirit of the Lord came upon David, he danced, and it was radical. And it was a sight to see. And Michael looks out and goes, that is absolutely obscene. This is ridiculous. You have lost your mind. Okay? And she's in good company in modern-day church. Are you with me? Yeah. Are you with me? When the Spirit of the Lord moves upon your heart, when there's this beautiful expression of this, of this worship, of this act, of worship Him with all your spirit, all your soul, all your might, with everything that is within you, this ecstatic state of joy and celebration is something that happens by when you get hit with the lightnings of God, the voltages of heaven. I want everybody to know this, but we're going to have to we're going to have to get out of we're going to have to get out of whatever earthly interest we're in, whatever things we're doing to try to please men. Most folks are more interested in how men view them than how God views them. As long as God don't, as long as God's the only one to see, I'll just do anything. But as soon as the pastor comes along, oh, I'm going to clean up the house. I'm going to put books away. <laughs> I might even put my TV away or lock out some channels. Who knows what's going on? Because all of a sudden, we're more interested in appearances. But who we really are is what we are when no one else is around. That's who we really are when it's just us and the Father, when it's just us and the Holy Ghost. That's the Lord says, if you are the person that seeks me there when no one else is around, I, I'm going to make sure everybody knows who you are because I'm going to reward you openly. Everybody's going to know that you've been alone with me. And then when no one else could see, you chose me and nothing else. Come on, people. Yes. Father is calling us to a place of truth. He's calling us to a place of being real. See, the, Spirit, the Holy Spirit is spirit of truth. He will not mix it up with a lie. As long as you want to live in a fantasy, as long as you want to live in the fantasy of hurt, it's a fantasy. It's an illusion. It was created by the master of deception who is a master at his craft. It's an illusion. It's all imagination. Oh, yeah, some little thing happened, but I'm going to tell you, you're an expert of turning a molehill into a mountain. And God wants you to be able to turn, get rid of mountains rather than creating them. It's all, people live on 99% imagination imagination and God in and, and, and literally the word that is used in 2 Corinthians 10 4 literally is the word for logic and reasoning well I logically conclude that what you just talked to me was rude 
(laughs) and that you don't like me and uh, who's been talking behind my back and before long you've got the whole world against you and they've all been conspiring in the room (laughs) about how bad you are imagination cast it down bring every thought into submission the obedience of Christ Jesus hey come on how about we practice this do we want to go there Do we want to follow him? He's only going to lead us and guide us in truth. Do we want to go in a lie? He's not going there. He's going to lead us and guide us in all truth. He's going to show. He's going to teach us everything that belongs to the ways of God. Everything that is holiness. Everything that is righteousness. Everything that is purity. Everything that is good. Take take one fruit of the Spirit. One fruit of the Spirit. I love one fruit of the Spirit. I love all of them. But there's one fruit of the Spirit that just really stands out to me. The fruit. One of the fruit of the Spirit is goodness. Could you imagine living in goodness all day long? Could you imagine that God has planned for you to live in goodness all day long? My, this is good. I'm living in goodness. Huh? In fact, the Lord said to this Moses, said, I will cause all my goodness to pass before you. Because now his presence defines goodness. Ooh. And the fullness of his presence. So I'm going to go back to the scripture with all saints. You may know what is the height, the breadth. So all, not just a few, not just the leadership, not just, you know, a, a people in a period of time, but all saints can understand the height, the breadth, the length, the depth, to know something that people, people just, if you can understand that you, this God is calling you to live and dwell in, a, in this realm called love. <laughs> to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge. There you'll be filled with everything that belongs to God. All his fullness. Wow, how simple. <laughs> to know and believe the love that God has for us, God is love. He that dwells in love dwells in God. Isn't that amazingly simple? Isn't it amazingly simple to grasp this idea, this beautiful call in Ephesians chapter 3, verses 18 and 19, in, 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 in concept with 1 John chapter 4, verse 16 and 17? He that dwells in love dwells in God. Wow. Now what happens? What, what, what pulls me out of love? Fear, hate, disappointment, discouragements, all these people problems. You know, you know what 99% of your problems are? Relational. Did you know that most of your problems are all just relationship problems? Did you know that there's very few problems you have that are outside of relationship problems? Did you know that those are all your personal problems? Did you know that that is the most, your relationships is the most important thing to Father? And that he defines your relationships that you have with the brethren? He defines his relationship with you on the same basis? Uh Uh-oh, now we're in trouble. Huh? Because Father, I mean, come on, dear people, covenant breaking is treachery, just like sin is treason. Could you grasp that? Could you leave out of here tonight with the possibility of actually really feeling the weight of that, that sin is treason, that covenant breaking is treachery, that sin, including the lies, is damnable to the point of spending eternity in a place called the lake of fire? Somebody said, well, how can that be love? Hang on, I'll show you. I'll tell you. Come back. You got to come back next time. If you understand that, I'll tell you. Because God, Father makes it very, very clear. And I say, yes, it, I'm telling you, he's the smartest person alive. God, he's the smartest person alive. He has got it figured out right. Every one of his judgments are absolutely right. They're righteous altogether. He, if you had the time to really reason it all out, everything that God said you would completely and totally agree with if you could be smart enough. It's a good thing that Father doesn't save us based upon our intellect. Hallelujah. <laughs> that he just simply makes an opportunity for us to just come and love him. He says, I want to love you. I love you. I want to love you. Will you let me love you? Now, the only way I can love you is we got to get rid of all this lie and all this iniquity. It's the only way I can really love you. But I said, somebody said, I don't understand that. God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. Yes, he loved the world, that he so loved the world, but I have a relationship with him. That's why Jesus said in John chapter 14, if you obey me, then my father will love you, and then we will come make our dwelling with you. It's not a contradiction. It's the issue of God's love. He's just loving. He's loving. He wants to rescue people from their prison. However, it's not a relationship love, a oneness love, a place where he's loving you, you're loving him back. Because God's kingdom, you know, if you try to understand a theocracy, they try to understand what is it like to live under a divine dictatorship. (laughs) Listen, the government of God is relational. If you love me, if you love me you'll obey me wow can you imagine living in a government like that for the rest of eternity i'm telling you it's good and the one who rules he rules not only with righteousness and judgment and 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 equity and purity but he is just deeply in love with you personally wow 
Come on now. Come on, man. This is not a fairy tale. This is reality. Now I'm going to try to look at this verse of scripture real quick. Luke. Kataki naka asteke eki naka peke. Tok nasteke limakishi katekea. Rati extipota. Stipero nostu extipa. Lestipino tikana estipiati. Ningesto poraneka. Bakste. Ine mekia la kiekia manikatusta. In Jesus' name. Berena kate kukana setea pak. Just hang on, I'll give you an interpretation in a minute. Mandebrine toya. Mangalasatona kishte. Boratani ishe. Ste no kishte koneste ke ne bekea. Taktona ne kishte paktaya. Lokane ixtia ti. Ho jitaya. Ne mati. Listen, you must understand that the word of the Lord is a means by which we are able to have authority over the things that would imprison us. You, in this culture, in this time, in this generation, like no other time, are literally immersed in iniquity and lasciviousness and evil. It, it saturates not only the atmosphere, but it saturates the media. It saturates the whole society in which we live. And, of course, now that the leaders of our country is, has has uh, attempted to change the very laws of nature and the laws of God. Do you know that? By saying that a man and a man can be married, joined in marriage. That a woman and a woman can be joined in marriage. That is to change the law of nature and the law of men. Now, there, there, we, we are in perilous times, dear people. And so I want you to open your Bibles and I want you to understand what your proper response is now. I, I'm going to read... I'm going to read two passages of Scripture to you. I'm going to read this verse of script, passage of Scripture here in Luke chapter 12. And I'm going to take you to read a passage of Scripture in Mark chapter 13. And then we're just going to see what God will do. But I want you to know the word goes forth to set you free. He sends forth his word to heal them. Listen, this is God's word we're sending forth to heal you. His word gives you an enlightenment. Enlightenment. In other words, it gives you revelation. The ability to understand things you could not understand before. Okay, to perceive things that before were hidden from you. Okay, he opens up our understanding with his word. Tonight, the spirit of wisdom and revelation is here in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ so that you may more fully appreciate what it is he's asking you to do and do, do it with him. God's never asked us to do anything that he's not empowered us with the ability to do it. So when, we, when God says, I want you to do this, we don't have to look to human ability. We don't have to say, well, this is too much for me to do. Rather, we can say, Holy Spirit, I yield to you. Do this through me. Because he both wills and does it as good pleasure through us. This is the empowerment. So God has empowered us. Everybody's all stuck on the fact that Satan goes about as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. Let me encourage you. The eyes of the Lord go to and fro seeking whom he may empower. I'm telling you, it's a whole lot a better situation to find yourself in being empowered rather than being devoured. I wouldn't fear. Amen. Don't fear, so long as you're not allowing sin in your life. If you allow allowing sin in your life, I'd be afraid. You, did you hear what I said? Yes. Okay, the, you know, and, and people, if you talk about, oh, well, they want to go back and understand some of the foundational principles in Judaism. Well, one of the foundation principles in Judaism is to fear sin. Why? Because you're going to end up under a heap of rock right. if you get caught. Huh? Because the law judges you. What is the law? It's a testimony of the way God feels about sin and iniquity. Has he changed his opinion? Has he grown up since then? Has he had an enlightenment? Has he had an, uh, Come on. Father Phil said this way, just as sin is dead. Sin is evil. It's, 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 it's propagated by the forces of hell, the enemies of God. I've asked the Lord many days, many times in my life, Lord, why do you allow sin to go on? Why do you allow sin to go on? Why do you allow sin to go on? Sunday morning, I stepped off the pulpit right here, and the Lord told me, when I hit right here, the Lord told me, here's why I allow sin to go on. And so I preached on it Sunday morning. Everything was changed for me right there. Of course, that's the way it happens to me. The Lord is showing us and proving to all angels and men and all creation for all of time that the smallest little bit of sin, the slightest little bit of sin, always will end in the same conclusion, total hatred and defiance of God. 
You see in the book of Revelation, men want to kill God. It's, it's unjust for him to try to force his will upon us and make us do what it is he wants us to do. Those narrow-minded, conservative Christians, they know better than ISIL. Watch it. It's a new kind of hatred rising, and it's receiving its power from within the ranks of a modern-day apostate church. Hear me. Hear me. Hear me. I'm not guessing. I'm, not, I'm telling you. These things which the Lord makes known to us. The Holy Ghost has come to make these things known to us, to reveal the word, to give us a spirit of wisdom and revelation, to cause us to see what's going to come to pass in the future. And, and the, the beautiful thing of it is that the Lord just lets us see it all together. Praise God. Huh? Man, if you could understand, the smallest little bit of sin that I might like would ultimately, if it's allowed to stay, it will develop. A little bit of leaven will make the whole lump leaven. It will develop into a place, if I continue to go with it, to where that I hate and defy God and think that he's unjust and want none of his rule over me, that he's, that he's cruel and that he's a hard man who sows, who reaps where he has not sown and gathers, he, he's unethical and gathers where he has not laid up. Watch out. Watch out. Jesus, help us. Help us to grab a hold of tonight the reality of heaven. People didn't come to church tonight. You know why they did it? Because they decided in their own mind what they would do with their life. Had nothing to do with the judgments of God. They live under their own judgments. They live only under their own decisions. And not only here, but all over the earth tonight. And the Spirit of the Lord says for us to join ourselves all the more together as we see the day approaching. And we understand what the first century church was doing. They were having church twice a day. They were in church twice a day in keeping with the morning and the evening sacrifice. And now how do we do that in our culture that demands us to go to work because we go to work because we owe, owe, owe. Off to work I go because I owe, owe, owe. And we just get, get, get sucked into the cares of this life. And we got to have a bigger house or any house. And then we got a mortgage. And we got a car payment. And God's so unreasonable. I can't even believe it. They expect that we should have you know, an offering and give uh, uh, 10% of our finances. Don't they understand that we're living our life for ourselves? Uh oh. Now somebody comes to the meeting. This is where they start feeling bad or getting mad. And said, I'm not coming back anymore. He's a cult leader. He's controlling. <laughs> Jesus. Hard men. A hard guy. All oh, those are lies. Lies. Damnable lies. In Jesus' name, I break the power of those lies. Those fearful, lying, demonic tactics that work in Southern California so effectively that as soon as the Word of God begins to go forth with authority, all of these lying spirits rise up in the ranks of churches and religion and cry, foul. Listen, it's a lie from hell that they are screaming. People, what did they hate about Jesus? They hate his authority. They said he was a devil. They said he was everything that, that, that the religion will call anybody today and more for speaking this authoritative word and demanding people to step over the line, to deny themselves, and to come and fully consecrate themselves to live another kind of life, the life of God, the life of Christ Jesus, the life that the Holy Spirit teaches us. Yes. To live, to where that all of our expressions, attitudes, appetites, and emotions can be defined and categorized in some dimension of the fruits or evidence of the Holy Spirit in control of our life. Ruling our life, controlling. Somebody said, oh, some theologian said, ah, oh, the Holy Ghost wouldn't control you. Well, give me a break. He lives and, and abides in my very being. He, he's the one who I'm supposed to be led by. I'm supposed to walk in him. I'm supposed to be guided by him. I'm supposed to live by him. My spirit's supposed to be submitted to him. Yes, I want God to be in control. Give me a break. I want him to rule over me. I say, Jesus, come take your rod of iron and do that work that only you can do and smash every vessel like a potter would smash a marred vessel of clay and then stamp it to the ground. As Moses did, the idol of whoredom that Aaron formed and fashioned and said, Up all ye Israel, a feast is proclaimed unto Yehoah. Amazing that Aaron did that, hey? 
Well, I see the same thing going on now. I see the sons of Belial now. I see the sons of Baal now. I see Baal worship now. Those demons have never left. Those angels of darkness have never quit playing in the midst of the camp of God. They're not. I hate reading Judges, but the reason I hate it so much is because I see the living evidence of it today. People think that those angels died and went away. No, they got different clothes. They're modernized. They modernized. They adapted. And there's only one defense against it. God's word alone is a light unto our feet. It's a light unto our path. <laughs> you know, I, as some of my dear friends were beginning to mix uh, secular, you know, just, well, any psychology, it's Christ, there's Christian psychology is a misnomer when it's really taught to us by a secular world. And just trying to mix that with, in, in terms of dealing with their children, I said, no, 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 no. You can't mix it. It is actually formed out of a realm of the prince of the power of the air. And you can't mix it with God's word. Only God's word will work. Only God's word lives and abides forever. His word is tried and is proven. His word shows us very clearly. We must understand it's the only place of safety. The name of the Lord is a high tower. The righteous run in and they're safe. Come on now. The gang plank is down. God is calling us. He's saying, come on into Jesus. Hurry. Come on into Jesus. Come on into Jesus. Before it's forever too late. People don't believe that <laughs> my dear friend, evangelist Tim Hall, he was, he was with, uh, you know, he's on staff, one of the leaders at Planet Shakers, and they take a, a group of, of, of folks from uh, Planet Shakers leadership, and, and they were doing something down in Israel, and he started talking about how that, the whore, that blood will flow 200 miles up three to four feet, and he was showing from Lebanon down into Bozrah. And to the, going through the valley of Megiddo, a staging place, said so this is merely a staging place. And he began to talk about the ge geography as it's laid out in the Word of God. And people began to just, people began to become all distraught. And they, they said, they said I, I thought all that was over. I thought the wrath of God was over at Calvary's cross. No, 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 dear people, you don't understand. Father puts sin to death for everybody who wants to be delivered from it. Look around you. There's a lot of people who, look, the, though they sit in darkness... <laughs> and under the shadow of death, the light appeared to them. A great light shone into their face. But men loved darkness rather than light because they loved evil. This is reality. I was just start reading the book of Revelation, starting chapter 6. In fact, we're having a Revelation study this Friday night. And the Lord told me to do that a number of months ago because of all the crazy stuff that's being taught on the book of Revelation. And, you know, I, I, all, all I can say is I praise God that I was raised up in good doctrine around holy men of God from the time I was a little guy. And I was raised by people that says, if they say you must prove and understand everything about what God wills for our life and wants for our life and is going to do in the earth through his word. Don't add to it. Otherwise, these plagues shall be added to you and don't take it from it. Otherwise, your name shall be blotted out of the book. <laughs> and so with holy fear and trembling, we come and we understand, here's what God says. Don't try to, you know, make it work or fit into your modern day concepts of thinking. And, and uh, hearing all these nonsense, crazy ideas, I just was so stirred by the Lord. And so we put them on YouTube. You can go to www.abidingplace.com, go to the YouTube place, and you can see the various different episodes of the book of Revelation. And I'm, I'm going to do, I think I'm going to do two more weeks. So I'm pretty much wrapping it up. But, um, you know, I, I'm, you can start in chapter 6 and you can see God's wrath poured out upon that. What's happening? That's how God feels about sin. Whose sin? Yours, mine, anyone's. Therefore, don't have it. Let's go over here in this love relationship. He's empowered us to learn righteousness. Righteousness is far better than sin. Amen. Huh? Yes, okay. Righteousness, God, sin, devil. Okay, we got that? God, good, devil, bad. It's just really simple stuff, okay? Now, how, are we sure that, that God's got a problem with sin? Absolutely. He is. I thought sin was okay because where there is no law, the sin is not imputed. Well, then go tell Noah that. Because you're misunderstanding the verse of Scripture that you're trying to quote from Romans chapter 5. You misunderstand. You misapplied that if that's the way you're going to do it. You are now standing up and defying Genesis 1-1 to Revelation 22-21 by such a conclusion. Nonsense. It's deception. Huh? Righteous, look, grace does not reign by sin. Grace reigns by righteousness. Romans 5, 21. Hello? <laughs> Somebody thinks grace right, right, reigns by sin. I know sometimes people can tell you, 
Listen, all I'm asking you, if there's, listen, I want you to hear me. Those of you listening to me by the web, those of you here with me tonight, I'll ask you to do this one thing. If there's ever been a time that people need to read their Bible more, it's now. And I'm not talking about spot checking or looking for loopholes. Okay, I'm talking about systematically starting at a Genesis 1-1 and reading through Revelation 22-21. And when you're done, start back at the beginning. And whatever pace you need, if it's 30 minutes a day, that's all you can find for God. <laughs> Should I say that again? Can I, should I be rougher? Yeah. <laughs> should I be? Ah. <laughs> then that's two times a year for 30 minutes reading. But I pray you'll step it up and find out that you can do six readings a year and still have time for Bible study. Yeah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise the name of Jesus. <laughs> Around my house, we're always asking, where are you at? <laughs> And, you know, we said, well, we're going to give, a, we're going to give, a, 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 we're, you know, discovering thresholds. Discovering thresholds. How quickly can you read the New Testament? It's, it's, it's fun. It's fun because what happens is suddenly as you're crying out to God through the process, Lord, give me wisdom. He begins to open your eyes to behold wondrous things out of his word. And it's just a beautiful experience. I have never experienced the manifest presence of God as I have, sitting and reading his word. And I have been so blessed from a youth to be around all, many, not all, but most of the primary leaders that God raised up in the United States of America and around the world, even into this day. And praise God to be in wonderful, great Holy Ghost meetings, just signs and wonder Holy Ghost meetings, to have many encounters with God. But I'm just saying that in the context of that, there is no place whew, like sitting here in Kamambaru Satea La Mahatea. In a mosefetea, in a realm called the Spirit, has to carinate. Amen. So I, I pray you get after it. Take that. Verse 35 Let your loins be girded about and your lights burning. I wanted, I, I really, this is what I was going to preach on tonight. This is how I was going to start. And now it's already, I'm, fi I'm finishing time. Okay. But what I want to be able to point out to you is I want you to look at the readiness. In the context here, the Lord is, to, first of all, he's telling us the state of heart and the way that we ought to live, taking no thought for our own life, taking no thought for what we should eat, taking no thought for what we should wear, seeking first the kingdom of God. Corollary chapter of the Bible to Matthew chapter 6 and chapter 7. Are you with me? Is everybody with me here? Okay. The seeking first the kingdom of God, the conduct, conduct the manner, the way that we should be ultimately giving ourselves completely over to walking in the ways of the kingdom. And now the Lord says, the Lord says to us, and, and really what the, the point is that, I, that Father's going to drive home through these th two chapters. I don't read to you Mark chapter 11, or forgive me, Mark, uh, Luke chapter 12, Mark chapter 13, is that you do, no one knows when the Lord is coming. Even though I can tell you all about, I can lay out for you a lot of things prophetically that need to happen, they can happen overnight. They can happen in a day. And, 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 and in other words, the Lord could come this evening and all the things that need to take place in order for all of the events of prophecy to be fully lined up and fulfilled can happen tomorrow. It's true. I mean, we have watched more changes in the Middle East. I mean, you know, hey, I, I'm certain that I'm, and you're going to hear me talk a bit about this on, on um, a Friday night, but I'm certain that, and I can prove to you that Paul believed that he was living in the day that the Lord Jesus was going to come. He, he said, well, we which are alive and remain. We which are alive. He didn't say those guys <laughs> that are there alive at the time. He said, we which are alive and remain should be caught up to meet him in the air. Comfort one another with these words, okay? The Lord shall, uh, the, the Lord shall uh, descend with the voice of a, tr a trumpet and the uh, sound of a trumpet, the voice of an archangel. And the dead in Christ uh, shall rise first. And we which are alive and remain should be caught up in the, to meet him in the air. Comfort ye one another with these words. Words. Now, look, it, for me, and the way I perceive things, even though there were so many events taking place during Paul's life leading up to the 70 AD and all the events that took place around there, I mean, you know, 78 AD, uh, uh, some major events, major gr calamities, great catastrophes took place around the world, Pompeii being one of them. Many things of that, of that nature happened. But today, more than ever before, the landscape of the last days is set before us. It's all sitting in place. I mean, it is, it, to, to begin to express it, you're just going to have to wait till Friday night because I, I, if I got on that, <laughs> if I got on that box, I wouldn't get off of it for quite some time. But it's, I, it's very important for us to look at what the Lord Jesus Christ is saying here. This is his message. When you have your loins girded, uh, I'll just take you back into culture just a little bit. 
back in those days, guys wore dresses too. Not dresses. They wore, you know, just robes, okay? Everybody, like, wore robes. Girls had their own type of robes, though, praise God. And guys had their own kind of robes. But around the house, you know, if you were just hanging out around the house, you didn't have the belt on. You just walked around with the robe on. Are you with me? If you put the belt on, that's to go outside. It's like the readiness of Passover. He said, listen, I'm going to pass over you tonight. Be ready to go. And it's like, it's like almost like don't even lay down when you go to sleep. It's like sit up sleeping. They were supposed to be almost in a reclined position getting ready to leave out the next morning. This is what he's saying. He's saying the urgency, the kind of watchfulness, the kind of readiness that he demands is his servants that are always waiting for his return that as soon as he knocks, they can immediately open up the door because they're they were sitting there. They're, he's going to knock. He's going to invite them to a wedding, which is the, the marriage supper of the Lamb. Um, what? Revelation 19, 6. Blessed and holy is he that is invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. Wow. Come on. I've been invited. My, I've got my reservation. I, I, I received mine. I received mine um, in the mail. The Holy Ghost mail. I, 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 have, I, I have a reservation. My, my place is reserved in heaven. Are you with me? Yeah. So I, I pray that you got this. And so that as soon as he knocks, we're not going to hang out in the house. We're ready to go to the supper. As soon as we're ready to go. He's, we don't know what time or hour or moment or day our master shall come. As soon as he knocks. Well, what, where are we at? We're, we're, we're standing here now having to have our lights burning. And, and there's several ways to understand this. First and foremost, it's a dark hour. It's a, it's a nighttime moment. It's having now as... as Paul said, using basically the same terminology in Ephesians chapter 5, and I believe it's verse 14, he, he says, you're, you're, you're no longer sleeping, you're awake now, you're no longer, you know, you're no longer people of the night, you're people of the day, and he, and he calls us to, to gird up ourselves and to have our lights burning. We hear the Lord says, here's a, he says, have your lamps burning. So we're, what, what's happening? We're ready to be able, first and foremost, to see how to navigate through the darkness. We're able to be able to see how to sidestep all of the things that would otherwise lie in way to destroy us if we, weren't, if we didn't have lamps burning. But I think that even more than that, God's talking to us about shining as a light unto the world. The city set upon the hill. The reality of it is, is this, people. The Lord didn't light any of us up with the light of salvation. We're living in a time where now the Lord says, Rise and shine for your glory has come. The glory, your light has come. The glory of the Lord has risen upon you like the rising of the noonday sun. Huh? He doesn't expect that we should sit in obscurity. He didn't, light a, he didn't light a candle to put it under a bushel. He lit the candle to put it in the highest place. Why is it that we're not shining in the highest place? There's something that needs to be adjusted in our lives. Father wants things to be adjusted in the midst of the church so the church begins to shine with the brightness of his glory, this gospel of the kingdom, his way of life, his deeds, his signs, his wonders, his miracles. I want you to look quickly with me in, in Mark um, chapter 13. And just hopefully I can bring s some of that together real quick. S the, so the soberness. I mean, to live in that kind of expectation of the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ is absolutely a condition of being caught away. But more than that, it's a disposition of being continually filled. The Lord says there's one way to redeem the time for the days of evil. How, what do you do? Dude, God's given us a formula, if you would. He's given us a remedy to redeem the times because the days are evil. What is it? Huh? Don't be drunk with wine wherein is excess. But what's going on with the church? What are they doing? They're drinking. What did the Lord say? He, say, he said, here's what they're going to be doing. In that day, they're going to be drinking. And they're going to be abusing their servants. And we've got all these different ideas, but what's happening is never before did we see the pit, never did anybody dream in the wildest imagination that the Pentecostal holiness movement of the 1700s and the 1800s, which ultimately resulted in the Pentecostal movement of the early 1900s, would, would be standing around getting drunk and getting stoned. And the Lord shows me, takes me places in dreams. He took me places in a dream last night where I was watching... Uh, People not only getting drunk, but they were smoking marijuana and doing other drugs, and they ultimately then go to the pulpit and preach. But of course, I already knew this stuff. You know, I know this stuff because of the things that that I have, you know, you know, been exposed to, being around the circles of ministries that the Lord's allowed me to walk in. And this is what's going on. 
People say, well, then they can go, oh, well, you know, we, it's, all okay. it's okay for us all to have a little social drink of wine. Jesus drank wine. You didn't know what you're talking about. When they said that Jesus was, a, oh, turn this up. When they said that Jesus was a wine bibber and a gluttonous man, that is to say he's a rebellious son. Didn't you read that in the book of Leviticus and Numbers? They were, they, were actually, they were actually speaking evil against him. They weren't telling a fact. To be a wine bibber and a gluttonous man is how you, uh, parents would come. If you have a rebellious son, you come and you tell to the priest, say, I have a rebellious son who will not listen to us. He is a wine bibber and a gluttonous man. And then you take stones and stone him. That you may crush the son out of Israel. And now if you were going to say, well, Jesus, Jesus went and he made 160 bottles of wine at the marriage of Canaan so that he might show forth his glory. He made 160 bottles of alcohol so everybody can get drunk. A bunch of, monks, among, a bunch of holy, virtuous people. Mary, his mother, was there. Family members were there. They went to family weddings. He attended a family wedding, a relative wedding. Give me a break. This is all nonsense. So they know nothing about what they're saying. They say, well, you're trying to tell me that that wine didn't have alcohol in it? Well, look, it had a slow alcohol content, but it was a law that it had to be diluted one to three. So by the time they got finished diluting it one to three, it wouldn't have been more than, you know, 0.5%. I don't think that you can, at most, that would be, that would be, that, that would be you know, up against it quickly turning into vinegar. Hello. Uh, are you with me? Uh, at the cross, Jesus refused the wine. He took the vinegar. Is that true? It's true. It is true. He, retook, he refused the Roman mixture of wine and uh, an herb that would ultimately help with the pain. When he said, I thirst, and, they gave him a, and he gave, then they gave him a sponge of vinegar, he took that. Hello. Did we... In all the Old Testament, you see over and again, at the moment of time of God's judgment, you see the prophet and the priest with the cup of judgment in their hand. What's the cup of judgment? The cup of judgment is an alcoholic drink. That's the cup of judgment. And so everybody who understands the symbolism of prophecy, the prophetic symbolism of the Word of God, everybody who understands these things that the Lord speaks over and over again through His Word, recognizes, hey, why, you know, I've, I said to people, don't you understand what you're doing? Turn to this verse of scripture, turn to that verse of scripture. That's what you're doing. And they're blind, they cannot see. Their hearts are hard and they cannot understand. They're, 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 they're not ready to go up. They're ready to stay here. See, when your loins are girded, you're ready to go up. Your, your home is in heaven. You're just occupying right now. You're just a sojourner. You, and you're seeking a city whose builder and maker is God. Abraham was very, very wealthy, but he chose to live in a Bedouin tent because he didn't want to be attached to this world. That's why the Lord says, if you look, <laughs> my seed goes forth and is sown on all kinds of ground. If you're good ground, you're going to bring forth 30, 60, 100 fold of everything that belongs to the realms of, this, of the kingdom. And I'm not talking about some financial blessing. I'm talking about far greater riches than, than reducing this thing to, or to a place of monetizing it. I'm talking about the spiritual riches. I'm talking about, my goodness, this wonderful realm uh, of walking and dreams and visions and revelation, word and knowledge, communing with the Father, hearing Him speak, being filled up with divine power and glory, speaking yourself in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs as you're filled with the Spirit, which is equivalent to being baptized. Did you know that was true? I mean, if you knew that was true, being filled is equivalent to being baptized. Amen. Text proof of his uh, uh, Acts chapter 1, verse 5, and uh, Acts chapter 2, verse 4. Jesus said, You be filled. Uh, you be, rather, Jesus said, You be baptized in many days from now. And Acts chapter 2, verse 4 says, And they were filled. Okay? <laughs> so the Lord established the presidents right there. And of course, it goes on beyond that. But once again, if I try to teach speak on every subject here tonight you're not leaving and of course i love to because the more we talk about the word the more the more father gets excited about the things the holy ghost gets about excited about the things your heart gets ready to receive and the more miracle signs and wonders will happen in your life and the more gifts of the holy ghost you'll be able uh, to also receive and the working of the holy ghost in your life will be, will be that much easier for you because god's word just clears the air clears the atmosphere Amen. hallelujah <laughs> praise the name of jesus is everybody in mark chapter 13 Mark chapter 13. And uh, just look at verse 33. Some of you are going, hey, I was just in that verse of scripture. The Lord just spoke to me that last night. I get that all the time. That's the way it works, doesn't it? Yeah. I was just in that. The Lord just saying something. He's saying something all right. Because today, it, now, the, the, our, our redemption uh, the coming of the Lord is far much, is much, much closer. 
than it was when the Lord says, Behold, I come quickly. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I, I think this is a beautiful night for the Lord to come. Sometimes I think he's going to come at night because there's so much of the descriptions right around night. I think he's going to come at a time when men don't expect him to come. That should be Sunday night. <laughs> Everybody's done with the Lord. It's now time to think about the work week. Huh? Cares this life, deceitfulness of riches, pleasures of this world. What was going to happen to that? They'd be choked. They'd be hung up. Huh? They'd be snared. I pray you get this. I pray I just think dude, this think Papa's crying out. He's, he's, looking for, he's looking for some folks who are going to be willing to turn their life over to him. He's looking for a group of people. I'm telling you, the great revival of Wells under Evan Roberts happened with just about eight, nine people in the meeting. It changed, it changed culture. It changed the world. It set the stage for the 1906 revival at Azusa Street and great, other great revivals all around the world. Just a small group of people. God's not picky, just looking for some people who are sold out to have it in his way. We're going to do it your way, Father. We want it. We want everything about our lives to be changed. We want everything about our lives to be defined by you. Lord, we want to be conformed to the image of the Son. Oh, Lord, that you might be the firstborn among many brethren. Verse 33, the Lord Jesus says, Take heed, watch, and pray, for you know not when the time is. He's talking about the coming. He's saying it could come any time. The Lord says this over and over again. I, I thought to take you through many verses of Scripture tonight to establish the fact and the point that many have forgotten that the Lord Jesus Christ can come at any moment, at any time. He is not relegated to a certain period or events to take place before He can come. The man of sin, the Antichrist, is relegated to a certain events that must first take place before He can be made manifest, before the, before the Son of Perdition can be revealed. But Christ Jesus, nothing prevents him. He come at any time, any moment. We're supposed to be ready, watching for him. No one knows, not even angels heaven. He doesn't know. Only the Father knows. Only Papa knows. God. If you don't think that you're in perilous times, dear people, I'm going to tell you right now, think again. We in perilous times. If you don't realize that we in a moment in time where there's seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, where people have itching ears, not willing to hear the truth, we're in those days. If you don't think you're a fast approaching right now, a time where we'll be hated by all nations for his name's sake, I'm telling you, we're there. If you, if you think that God is going to allow these things to stand, uh, that has taken place in the United States of America, I tell you, he is not. It is over. It is over. Listen, they, they didn't know when they shook the, their fist in the face of God, says, we do not want your laws, that they were saying, we don't want your protection nor your provision either. Hey, yeah, we've had ups and downs in the past, and we might have had some really, you know, hypocritical leaders, but all the way through the process, we had people that crying out. We had people to stand up and say, we're a godly nation. We want to be a godly nation. We, we serve the Lord Jesus Christ. It, God is the Lord. I mean, we've had that commitment as a nation, as a nation, as a people. Yes. We don't have that anymore. Our leaders have taken us to a different direction, and we, and you know, we, whew, whew, we were just... We watched as that deception work. I, I, I couldn't watch the news for over a year, wasn't it, baby? I watched that. I watched that deception work because I watched that election time. I watched the deception work, and I watched the response of people, and I saw how Satan used the media, the news media, so effectively that it was just that much. I, I already knew that Satan was already had his fingers, his claws in the news media, and that he, he, it was, he was the spin caster of it all, and he was reporting those things that he wanted men to come under uh, the influence of. But boy, was it ever so strong at that moment in time, how they were used in or, or, order to cast the deception that took place across the United States of America. To embark upon this change. And a change it indeed truly was. It was just the wrong kind of change. You better get ready. You better get ready. You better have your loin. You better, you better stop walking around your house with your robe loose. You better get your belt on. You better be in a posture before the Lord saying, Lord, here I'm out, here am I, I'm ready. Our master is like one who's gone along on, to a, on a far journey, who took all that belonged to his kingdom and he entrusted into his servants. To each he gave a three months worth of wage. And different ones 
took those things in the kingdom that belong signs, wonders, miracles, walking with him, learning his ways, doing that which he said to do, walking, functioning in his body of Christ, because those are the things that belong to the kingdom. And they went, and they prospered with them, and they allowed them to be developed and bring forth fruit in their life. But there was others that said, you're a hard man. You hard, you unreasonable. I've got my own job. I've got my own life to live. Preacher, don't you understand? We, we got to get up in the morning and go to work. Don't you realize we don't have enough finance? Don't you understand you're imposing upon us? We don't have to listen to this stuff. We've got our own life to live. It goes on everywhere. It's just true, people. It's just true. I hate to say it, but it's just true. It's true. Don't let it be you. You need to have your belt on. You need to have your lamp burning. You know, in other words, you're ready to walk out. You're ready to leave right now. You don't have any. You don't have to get the belt. You don't have to get the lamp re ready to, to, you know, so that you can see where to go. My wife is a queen of, of flashlights. She has every kind of flashlight for any kind of need. It, it, I marvel at it. She is always so prepared. That's why I'm hanging out with her. She is always prepared. If, if I'm going down the road, I'll think about something at the time I need. She's got it and everything else I could have ever imagined if I had time to think of it. She's prepared. She's ready. She's thought it through. She knows. I listen, I, I know. I see him before me. I'll let all of my actions. I'm, I'm sitting here with my light burning. Let all of my deeds and everything I'm doing that I know I'm going to give an account for be fully revealed to me as it is in the presence of God so that I'm living at the judgment seat. I used to have this concept. I'm almost done. Just hang with me. I used to have this concept of an altar call mentality or an altar call consciousness or an altar call awareness. Those things that the Lord did to, with me, that, that the reality of his holiness, the reality of the call that he has, that he has placed upon our life, they're on my knees in the altar in that move of God. And then the Lord brought me to a place of the judgment seat consciousness, the judgment seat mentality, the judgment seat awareness, recognizing that every deed, everything I say, every action must be weighed in the light of I'm standing here now already giving an account for what my deeds are in my body. People, God's calling us to have our, 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 our loins girt, girt about, our, ro the, our robe already with the belt on, ready to go. The lamp's already lit. We don't have to light it. <laughs> Tonight, I want you to grab this now. I want you to grab this. I'm telling you, the coming of the Lord is near. Listen to me. Yeah. I'm, I'm telling you. I am, I am telling you, listen to me. The coming of the Lord Jesus Christ is near. <laughs> my wife and I hadn't been married very long and uh, I had left a, uh, I had uh, left an alarm clock on and I didn't realize it and it was like 3.30 or something like that in the morning and so it was Sunday, early Monday morning and church had gone late and I had just fallen into a deep sleep and all of a sudden, this alarm clock came on, and it was the most beautiful trumpets going on. It was like one of box, you know, uh, symphonies, chorals, a uh, box, and it was just all these trumpets. And I immediately threw my arms up in the air to receive my spirit, Lord Jesus, because I thought the I thought the catching away was taking place at that very moment. That was the first time I was seated that it's going to happen at around 3:30 in the morning. Of course, nobody knows the day or the time. You know, I'm just. I'm just saying, you know, well, but that'd be a great time to go, eh? Yeah. Eh? Wouldn't it be a great time to go? Don't ever let the sun go down on your wrath. Eh? You understand, when you lay down, when you lay down at night to go to sleep, it better be more than now I lay me down to sleep and pray the soul, Lord my soul to keep. If I should die before I wake, I pray the Lord my soul to take. It better be more than that. It better be more than that. You better be ready. You better be ready. At noonday, you better be ready. Early in the morning, you better be ready. In the evening, you better, re better, better be ready. Listen, this is, what this, this is what Jesus is preaching. For the Son of Man is as a man taking a far journey who left his house and gave th authority to his servants. How many servants do we have here of the Lord Jesus? I, what did he give you? Authority. What did he give you authority over? All the powers of darkness. So nothing that belongs to sin and demon realm can by any means touch you, harm you. John was radical. We know. This is radical. Get ready. Brace yourself. Fasten your safety belts because we're getting ready to hit a whole nother gear. Listen to this. I, I, we know that everyone who is born of God does not sin. 
keeps himself and the wicked one has no access to him. That is a powerful, that is a powerful revelation of, of Luke chapter 10, verse 19. I give you authority to tread upon scorpions and serpents and over all the power of the enemy and nothing can by any means hurt you, harm you, touch you. Powerful. Well, no, you're going to have to live over here in the glory realm here. Ha. Huh. You're going to have to, because I'm going to tell you right now, if you take fire into your bosom, you're going to be burned. I'm telling you right now, if you commune with the world, it's going to take hold of you. It's a trap. I'm telling you right now, if your friendship with the world is an act of hostility against God, it, I'm going to tell you right now, have no, have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather what? Rebuke it. When's the last time you was rebuking it? First and foremost, things that you would allow in your living room. Because people in the church allow in their living room things that the people in the world would not allow 70 years ago. There was an outcry in the second community 70 years ago because there was a movie produced in Hollywood that had a word in it. And, and the word was damn. And the, and, 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 the, and the movie was Gone with the Wind. And now what do we do? We just sit there. We sit there numb to just a whole bunch of profanity and, and, and blasphemies and all ungodliness, demon seed, demonic inspirations, demonic powers. It's worse, it's worse than a sorcerer or a witch doctor or a witch, a warlock or a witch standing over you and cursing you. At least you know something's happening to you. It's worse than that because it's happening to you and you're totally passive to it. No resistance. This is true. This is true. I'm telling you, this is true. There's many men of God who've seen it. I know men, I know men of God who sit in, and we're having visions of uh, literally demon spirits coming out of the television. The Lord's showing them to go warn the people. Watch out, watch, watch out. And now it's at another level with what's going on in the internet and what's going on in the ministry. We, huh, we, when somebody daubed our walls with untempered mortar, the enemy came and they fell over. Read what Ezekiel the prophet says in Ezekiel chapter 18 about these people, these prophets and these priests who speak words that are not God's word. And what it is, it ultimately, it causes the people now to trust in a false safety, a false security. They didn't, and they daub now the, the walls that, 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 that they used or the, the cement, the concrete that they used to build, uh, lay brick upon brick, block upon block. They daubed it really with untempered mortar, mortar that would turn fla into flesh flaky sand so that there was no cohesiveness to it there was no structure to it and just lean on it and it would fall over and it was by it and the lord was likening that to the words that they spoke that were counsels of men and not the counsel of god the word of men <laughs> that would turn men's hearts away from god rather than the word of god that turned men's hearts to them people this is going on we the hinderer of iniquity. The church is the hinderer of lawlessness, in other words. But what if we're not hindering anymore? Then we overrun. We overrun. We're overrun. God gave Carlos Anaconda a special gift to take nations, to take cities, to take towns. What God did through him in the 80s and in, in, in the early 90s was just amazing. One day, Carlos was sitting with me, gave him a special authority over demon spirit strongholds that ruled over cities. He was saying to me one day, he said, Mark, he said, I want you to understand the United States of America in its godly position is the last fortified stronghold in the world. He said, he began, he says, Spain hates America because of who America is in Christ Jesus. And he went down the list of all the nations that he himself has preached in and God used him in such a mighty way. This is a man who has special authority over principalities and powers of darkness to tear down strongholds, to spoil the strong man, to, take, to, to bind the strong man that he might spoil his house. He knew what he was talking about. He does, still knows what he's talking about. Praise God, he's still alive and still running strong. It just, it was a special move back in those days, you know. But now it's different. It's different. It's different. Huh. It's different, people. It's different. You don't understand what's going on. You watch, you watch these TV preachers. You watch, listen to these, you know, you listen to all these different influences. And if you understood what was behind them, 
Ultimately, you wouldn't be listening to them. All I'm saying is if there's ever a time that God's people need to read the word, it's now. If you need to saturate, never, is there ever a time people need to saturate themselves with the word, it's now. God will show you. It's not a personal revelation. There is no private interpretation. All you've got to do is read it with a sincere and a hungry heart. Read it over and over again. You're not going to be deceived. I'm going to tell you right now because the spirit of truth will lead you and guide you in all truth. The word of God is a defense against deception. The truth will, bu oh, the truth will bust and stop and, 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 and prevent every life from taking hold of you these are perilous days it's perilous times the effect of pornography the stronghold you listen to me you listen to me the stronghold of pornography actually it was actually in in the tongue that i was using a little bit ago when, when my interpretations of tongue tongues are usually much longer than the tongue and I don't just, I don't stop and do it the old way of, okay, now the, here's what the Lord says. I'm just speaking on behalf of the Lord. And I'm not saying anything against, you know, the way my father and my mother and my grandparents moved in God. I'm not saying anything against that. I'm just saying I, this, the Lord does it different in me. It just comes out. Here it is. And uh, reality of it is pornography is a stronghold that will ultimately destroy your soul and heal it, it will wrap its tentacles around your neck and choke you till you die. There is only one way to get rid of it. It's all, and especially if you've been born again, people who are born again have been made a new creation and they've allowed that to entangle them. Your soul is in, most, in the most severe of jeopardy because now that's a stronghold different than someone who just lost and undone, don't know God or a son who basically has never, you know, they've never been born again. They've never been changed. All that can be broken instantly with the power of salvation. Now, all of a sudden, there's a demonic stronghold in your life. The only hope for you to do, only hope that you have is to destroy every access, every gateway that there is to it. Destroy it. Run from it. Flee from the wrath that is to come. Listen, it's happening all throughout the church. It's happening. It's a stronghold in the midst of the church. There was a group of people who went and did a study on this. They would go to wherever there was a pastor's conference or a leadership conference. They'd go into the hotel, which was public access data, and they would watch, and they would look at what, what was the baseline of the pornography channels as soon as there was a pastor's conference. And all these people came into the hotel. It literally went to a place that they could calculate that 70 days, between 70 and 80% of the church leaders were accessing pornography channels. If that's in the pulpit then it's in at the pew if it's overrun the man of God then it's overrun the people of God because where is the authority the priest is the one that is supposed to stand and hold back the powers of darkness it's this priest sin that defiles the inner chamber of the holies of holies when this priest sins the outer the outer altars don't have to be cleansed the outer altars have to be cleansed for the people's sin and if the priest sin and the king sins then the inner chamber the holies of holies altar has to be cleansed they defile the inner sanctum so what happens? Ichabod, God's glory departs. He said, well, I want to abide there. If it's defiled, I want to, be, want to abide there. The Lord would only return. If you just do some study in the book of, of Leviticus. I've, actually, I've posted, I've, I have a commentary in the book of Leviticus. It's posted at www.abidingplace.com. It's under the word ministry there. I have a commentary in the book of Leviticus. Understand these things. Because it, it, it is a time to tell us really so that we can see in a physical realm what's really happening spiritually. I have many things to say to you. That's why it's hard for me to have a short meeting. And uh, you know, people told me, people told me, they said, listen, you know, we, we, we really love you, Pastor. And if you would make the meeting shorter, we would come and our friends would come. So I made the meeting shorter and they left and their friends never came. <laughs> And I just did it out of a sincere heart to try. Oh, Father, well, I'll do this if this is going to help them. Do I have liberty? And Father gave me liberty. And now I'm back to where I was. Like Paul, you know, he preached all night, preached so long that the person fell down and fell asleep. It's okay to fall asleep in the meeting. They fall down dead. That's the, that's the tragedy. If you do fall asleep in the meeting, that could be the outcome. The good news is that there's enough authority to go raise them from the dead. And then what did Paul do? He continued to preach until the day. And then I, he took his journey and went to the next town, village. Because he felt that the time was short. His, his lungs were girded about with truth. His light was burning. He was about the master's business. The Lord has told us exactly what we're supposed to do. We're just supposed to be these evangel fires. We're supposed to shine as the light into the world. A city set upon a hill. We're supposed to rise and begin to shine with the testimony in our mouth of Jesus Christ to help people understand that they need to flee from the wrath to, to come. You need to, quit, uh, 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 you need to quit bowing to the demon power of humanism. You need to quit accommodating the antichrist spirit in the atmosphere and just letting people do whatever they want to and not to offend anybody. You need to become authentic. 
offensive for the gospel. You need to get your mouth open and not be ashamed of him in this, in this perverse and adulterous generation because he said, if you are, and I'm telling you the way the Lord measures, sin, me, me, measures uh, being ashamed of him is really very different than the way that people will self-justify how they measure what it means to be ashamed of him. I'm telling you, you need to get a be, become very vocal and tell people to flee from the wrath to come because God's, God's wrath, his anger is coming upon all sin and all iniquity. There end is an eternity without God in a place called the lake of fire. You need to open your mouth and start preaching the good news. The good news is that Christ Jesus has made a way that no matter who you are, you can be transformed by his power. You don't have to live in sin. You don't have to live in disease. You don't have to live in sickness. You don't have to live in torment. You don't have to live under the influence of demon power any longer. You can now take a step over here into the kingdom of God and begin to enjoy the goodness of heaven. You need to get the gospel on the inside of you so you can speak it out of your mouth. Get, you need to have your you need to have your ro, you need to have your loins girt about with the truth. First Peter 1 13. Right? I'm not don't turn there, but you know you need you have your loins. Be sober. Have your loins girt about with the truth. And hallelujah. Back to this. For the Son of Man is man taken his far journey, left his house and gave authority to his servants, and to every man to his work, and commanded the porter to watch. Watch ye therefore, for you know not when the master of the house comes at evening or at midnight or at the cock crowing. That was 3.30 in the morning. That's when the rooster starts going off, first light. Right? Are you with me? How many country people here? Nobody. A couple of people. In this home. I love the country. I love the country. I love being out in the woods. I love being out in the wilderness. I'm only here for one reason. Preach the gospel to people in San Diego. Stand here and lift up my voice as a trumpet and, and, and plead and intercede on behalf of the Lord Jesus Christ for this place. And we've done so according to the word of the Lord and what Father gave us to do. We've done it for 30 years, faithfully for 30 years. And the only times we've not been here is really is when we've been overseas and doing things in missions and couldn't get back. And we're not going to stop until the Lord says, okay, it's enough. It's enough now. It's enough. Turn aside and do this. I believe with all of my heart that every person in this place, you can rise up from here and you can go everywhere anointed of the Lord Jesus Christ, preaching, boldly preaching the gospel, and, and run your race in him, and fight a good fight in him, and have for you a crown of righteousness laid up, which cannot, will not fade away. To hear him say, well done, my good and faithful servant. That's all I want to hear him say. That's all. All I want to hear him say. And I don't have to wait to the end. I want to hear him say at the end of the day, well done, my good and faithful servant. And tomorrow morning, or tomorrow, at the end of tomorrow, I want to hear him say, well done, my good and faithful servant. And you know what? I'm going to say this. The Lord speaks to me more just because I'm just reading through the Word. If you'll do that, He'll speak to you. Everything will begin to be corrected in your life. The floodlight of heaven is shining upon your soul because you're just reading along, and boom, verse Scripture slams, stands up and just slams you right in the chest, right in the heart, right in the deep depths of your being. That's God talking to you. He's saying, this is what I want you to do. This is what I want you to take heed unto. Father's not a far away. He's not aloof. Holy Ghost is here right now. He is sojourning with us. He's tabernacling in us. He wants to speak to us. We're going to have to begin to mind spiritual things and give ourselves to a place in a place where we can hear him speak because he's speaking. Hallelujah. And you know, it's no secret place you've got to go discover. All you've got to do is open your Bible and start reading. Amen. All you've got to do is get down on your knees and start, start asking and say, Father, I want to know you. Oh, God. I want, to, I, want, I want to live in your presence, Father. I want, I want to be pleasing to you in every, good, in, in, in every way. I want to be developed and prepared unto every good work. And then the, he says, lest coming suddenly he find you sleeping. And we know what the end result is for those he finds sleeping. And I don't have time to take you through that in, in Ephesians chapter 5 and 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. But maybe we'll do that some other time. But what I say unto you, I say unto all. He says, watch. Watching. To watch in prayer. Pray with all supplication in the Spirit. Huh? 
How do you, how do you watch and pray with all supplication in, in the Holy Ghost, in the Spirit? How do you pray in the Spirit? Huh? A modern day religious church doesn't want to believe that, but Paul defined it, and it cannot be undefined. He defined very clearly the difference between praying in the Spirit and praying in the understanding. And when he's the one who defined it, everywhere he uses the same terminology in his epistles, in his writings, it is very clear all honest theologians have to agree with me. And all those who have already put this forth again and again, that it is indeed true. There is no proof text to in any way change what it means to pray in the Spirit, whether it's Ephesians chapter 6, verse 18, or whether it's 1 Corinthians chapter uh, 14, verse 15. And it's the total number of daikai. And so that I'm a to get an A. And so when we begin to say pray, begin to pray and build up yourself in your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost, Keeping yourself in the love of God. We know that there is a baptism in the Holy Ghost that Paul said when he said to the church, uh, the, the disciples he met at, in Ephesus. The first thing he said is he didn't say, have you been born again? He said, have you received the Holy Ghost since you believed? And they said, we didn't know that there was a Holy Ghost. And he laid hands upon them and they all began to Because Paul understood that the urgency, the need of it. And that's why I said I pray in the Holy Ghost more than you all. Hallelujah. And so, he, though he would rather speak, you know, 10 words with the understanding than 10,000 in the Spirit when he's in church, the issue is a hyperbole concerning the fact that he wants people to hear the Word of God so that they might understand. Not that it should be stopped, for he said, don't prevent, prevent anyone from speaking in tongues. He said, you may all do it. He that speaks in unknown tongues speaks not unto men but unto God. Howbeit he speaks for, uh, mysteries in the Spirit. What should we then do? What should we do then? We will pray with the Spirit and pray with the understanding also. We will sing in the Spirit and sing with the understanding also. I I can't help it that religion is a fortified defense against what God wants to do, but it doesn't matter because I'm going to bust that wall down in Jesus' mighty name. Hallelujah. God's people are going to rise up and bust it down. God's got himself a great big army that's about to rise up in the earth. I believe with all of my heart. <laughs> Hallelujah. Their faces are like lion. They run like horses. Fire devours before them. Hallelujah. The mind, there's a bouquet right now. I certainly believe in 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 the context of waiting for him, not knowing when he's going to come. I certainly believe that there is a great harvest that is going to take place on the earth, and it's going to happen. It's going to happen suddenly, and it's going to be such a powerful display of the of the glory of God. The 2.5 billion people who have not heard the gospel are going to eyewitness be eyewitnesses of the power and the glory and the majesty of the Lord Jesus Christ. And how is Father going to do that? Through those who are consecrated to walk with him. Because Father does all of his work through his covenant partners that he's made co-inheritors with Jesus and heirs of God. Amen. Not something that's just going to happen in the future, but something that is supposed to be embraced right now. So that we can go every place and proclaim this good news. And be witnesses of the resurrection. That's why he said, you must be endued with power from on high before you can ever be my witness. Ha, 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 hallelujah. Ha, 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 hallelujah. Praise the name of Jesus. Every man to his work. Every man to his business. Every man to the things that God has anointed them to do. Every man standing in his place faithfully. With the, with, with the workman's trow in one hand and the weapon in the other. Just like they did in the days of Nehemiah and Ezra. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Hey, Now I'm ready to start functioning in the gifts of the Spirit now. <laughs> Everybody else basically. I listen, I, I don't want you to I don't want you to be worn out. I know I know you need rest for your body. In the name of Jesus, I break the power of sickness and disease. I, I right now I command an immunity in Jesus' name against colds and viruses. In Jesus' name, flus, stomach flus, respiratory flus, in the name, in Jesus' name, sinus flus, in Jesus' name, uh, influenza of every sort. I break the power of it now. Maliko. Hallelujah. You come by. I command you to be healthy now in Jesus' name. In the Mongoro. After you sit so long a time in the building tonight, I pray in Jesus' name for a reward for you. In Jesus' mighty name. 
strength to your body to be able to stand against sickness and disease. I speak it to you. And in the name of Jesus, I don't care what plague there is or what disease it will not come die. Now you're dwelling in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. A thousand shall fall by your side, ten thousand by your right hand. I tell you, it will not come nigh you. I tell you, if the fire should it be kindled, it will not burn. It will not be able to kindle upon you. It, you will not be burned by it. The nuclear explosion would take place. You would be immune from all the radioactivity, from every, everything that would cause a disease or sickness or decay of the body. I tell you, in Jesus' name, even as the three Hebrew children stood untouched, in a fiery furnace where Jesus Christ was there revealed, where the power of God was made known. I tell you, so should be the people of the living God who will come here and abide in the shadow of the Almighty and dwell in the secret place of the Most High. Hallelujah. The Resultaya. He kind of, hey. Zitoya, brubo sutiara. Father, I thank you for the salvation of every family member that is represented in this place. Father, I thank you for a revelation of visitation from heaven. I break the mind-blinding spirits of the powers of darkness that would hide the gospel, that would blind the eyes and blind the hearts and minds of them. Father, even as Abraham interceded for Lot in the city of Sodom and Gomorrah, oh God, we right now petition you. We intercede for our family members. Oh God, and as Lot had received a visitation from the heavenly messengers, oh God, we pray in Jesus' name, by the same grace, our family members will receive a visitation from heavenly visitors. A visitation from heavenly ministers. A break off the yoke of fear. A break off the yoke of blindness. A break off the yoke of damnation. A break off the yoke of, of, of sin and of the devil. In Jesus, in Jesus' name. For the power that is in the name of Jesus Christ. In the name of the living God. Father, the powers of darkness that have held this city and this region in its grip so long. Father, in your mercy, we cry out. In your mercy, O oh God, save and deliver. Father God, in your mercy, show forth your power with mighty signs and wonders. To your people who have taken a hold of your authority, who are not ashamed to speak. Who not ashamed or fearful to step out and lay hands on the sick. Speak life into a dead body. Say to a crippled person, rise up and walk. To a blind person, see. To a deaf, hear. Father God, I pray in the name of Jesus, your people become valiant. They understand it's a different kind of fight than was in the days of David. And that they'll be valiant in you. To come out against all the powers of sin and sickness and disease. And with the authority that you've given to us. Not by, seer, not by sword nor by shield does God save. But by the mighty name of the living God. By the mighty name of the most high. By the mighty name of Jesus. Father we thank you for tearing down. Hallelujah that it may build up. Father we thank you for rooting up. That you may plant. Father, I thank you for the multiplication of every person in every life and every soul in this place. Father, I thank you for increase. I thank you for fruit in their life. Father, I thank that you that you give them a special capacity as your witnesses, O oh Lord, to see many souls, each one of them, to come into the kingdom, that no longer there would be a delay and no longer would there be a barrenness, O oh God. In Jesus' name, let every person become fruitful in you. Hallelujah. 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 Father, we thank you that we don't see devastation for Southern California, but we see a visitation from heaven. Father, even as you proclaim by, by, by Jack Cole, by Catherine Kuhlman and others concerning Southern California, that, yeah, though there may be great days of disaster, but yet there would be rather great days of glory. And Father, we pray in Jesus' name that every soul that is sitting in here tonight will be an instrument and a vessel in those yes, great Lord. days of glory. Yes. 
that their lamps will be burning in such a way that your glory and your power and your majesty and your might would be seen upon them. That your signs and wonders would be activated through their hands. Oh God, that your word of authority would be revealed and heard through their speaking and through their lips. In the name of Jesus Christ, according to the word of the King of Heaven, according to the mandate of Almighty God, I proclaim this to you. Now receive in Jesus' name. These are your, these are your gifts. These are your things. This is your mandate from Heaven. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Kura Sananea. Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Great change. Great change. Father, I thank you for a great moving of your spirit on the campus at UCSD. Father, I thank you that all those things that are prophesied concerning the campus of UCSD is going to come to pass. And the gods of intellectualism will fall like the, upon their faces. Dagon fell before the Ark of the Covenant. And everyone who would refuse and everyone who would try to prevent it would have the same consequences as the Philistines did in those days. Oh God, that those who have been held in the prison of men's manipulated power and demonic strongholds would suddenly be set free by a valiant people of men and women who stand up with a fierce countenance as those that are with the face of an angel and the power of the living God in the things that they say and do. Father, I pray tonight that your people will find their position, their identity in the kingdom and no longer desire things that belong to this world. Hallelujah. No longer allow things that would somehow <laughs> incapacitate this divine flow and gifting of the Spirit. But rather, oh God, they become energized by your presence. Hallelujah. That, the, that, that, that their faith will be effectual, in other words. <laughs> Hallelujah. That this divine power that is at work on the inside of us, Lord, will begin to be made manifest as we declare the simplicity of the word of, of life. For, Lord, we, we know what you did. You chose that all power and wisdom should be contained in the preaching of the gospel. The simplicity of the declaration of who Jesus is. I pray, Father, in the name of Jesus, that each person here in this place will begin to come under the influences of a spirit of supplication and prayer and intercession. Father, I pray that each person will become to understand what it means to be filled with the Spirit speaking to himself in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. I pray, Father, that each person will understand what it means in terms of the authority of God, the armor of the Spirit, the armor of the Lord, which is ultimately has as in, a manifest, in, in one of the manifest dimensions, praying with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit. Father, I pray that every person will come into the beauty of it. Lord, many have been healed back from it. They've not understood it. They've allowed things to hinder them. They've allowed their time tired bodies to hinder them. They've allowed the things in this world that has busied them to hold them back. But, and, and all the time they've been missing out on a glorious realm that they could be living in. Father, I pray in the name of Jesus they will bust through those hindrances and discover this glorious realm, a place that nobody would ever want to be without should they once discover it and find it and have it. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I want everybody to stand with me. Now, Kusipaya, Mombratai. Now, I'm going to just tell you what's going on. I'm going to tell you what's going on. I want you to just understand this. I want you to hear it. I'm going to tell you the atmosphere right now is right now at the point where the, the, the things begin to happen in the spirit. This is a, right. The people have got to learn. People think that God's like a running a, in an out burger. Fast food restaurant. We're just going to come in for a quick, you know, this and a quick that. No, 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 no. We wait upon the Lord. We come into his presence. We seek his face. We stay there and, 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 being, and being ministered to by the Spirit. Because then all of a sudden something is activated in the realms of glory. There's a, there's a realm of faith activated in the realms of, he, of the heavenly that then causes an unfolding of those, uh, all of those wonderful things that Father has blessed us with freely. To begin to, to be received, to become begin to begin to be understood in a very simple, in a, in a very simple, intimate, relationally relationship way, relationally way, relational way. <laughs> Rather, <laughs> Hallelujah. We want you to understand this. We don't want you to get tired of sitting in the meeting or whatever. We want you to understand. Wait, wait, wait a minute. We're pressing in. This is a press in time. This is a, this is a waiting on the Lord time. Hallelujah. Furababa. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord Jesus.
Now, I know the Lord has spoken to a number of different people about specific things here tonight. And I want you to be ready now to go ahead and be set free. I know that there are people here tonight. You've had uh, this. Look. <laughs> the statistics is one in three. One out of every three kids are molested in our United States of America. That's a terrible statistic. And that creates all kinds of problems in people's lives. And there's a huge population of that that takes place in the church. I pray God in Jesus' name it never took place in this church. But, you know, my goodness, this is, we're looking at this stuff. The 70 to 80% of the people that are standing in the, in the meetings in churches, that's seven or eight people out of every ten, are in some way uh, 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 addicted to pornography. Which is to God, I mean, which is a damnable sin. Father said, if you defile the temple, I'll destroy your soul in hell. Look, we're going to have to understand, people, you can't play around with this stuff. You don't have your loins girded up with truth. You don't have your loins girded up, ready to go up when these things are going on. This thing has got to be broken now. And Father's not going to violate your will. You've got to participate with them with your will and say, okay, tonight. Now, husbands, you're going to have to get in submission to your wife and start getting transparent. And, and wives, you're going to have to be, listen, I'm, say, I'm saying submission in sense of accountability. Not in, not in contradiction to the scripture. Everybody knows how I feel about it. Okay, I got lots of stuff published on that. I mean, I, there's a whole riots that have taken place over some of the things I've preached on that issue. But there needs to be a transparency. There needs to be an accountability. I mean, if you even have those of you who have any place or any, any stronghold there, any sin or any activity there at all, any propensity towards that at all, I tell you right now, you can, that thing can be broken. It cannot even tempt you. There is a place of glory that you can live in that you will hate and despise it. You're going to have to get, you're going to have to start confessing stuff and stop trying to hide your sin or cover it as Adam did because you will not prosper but rather be destroyed. You're going to have to come out with it and confess it. Every great revival of the past always was, always was highlighted, earmarked by people confessing, publicly confessing, this is what I've been doing. It's true. Go back and read church history. You confess to your wife, you tell your wife. Or, or wives, you confess to your husband, you tell your husband, you hold yourself, in account, hold yourself accountable. What will you, women, you just look at your husband and say, are you having a problem? And if you lie, you're going to be lying to Jesus. You're lying to the Holy Ghost, I'm going to tell you right now. Okay? Yeah, yeah. Now look, come on, I want, to, I want you to agree with me because I want this thing broken off of you. I want this thing broken off of you. We want this broken off of you. Father has a place for you to go. He has a place for this church to go. He has a place for his churches everywhere to go. But he can't take them so long as there is sin and iniquity is accommodated in his church and in his, among his people. He just can't. He loves us. He's going to work with us. He's going to do everything he can possibly do to bring us to repentance. How valuable is heaven to us? How valuable are the realms of heaven? People say, well, I want to talk about dying and go to heaven. You can live in heaven right now. And if you don't live in heaven right now, you're not going to live in heaven after you die. For as a man dies, that is how, that is how you spend eternity. You can't live wrong and die right. It's time for you to get right. It's time for you to get right. It's time for you to get right and stay right. If you have a computer, if you have a computer and you've accessed any kind of pornography from it, you need to get rid of that computer. You need to get rid of it. I said you need to get rid of it. You need to treat a computer like going into a, 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 a pornographic store. Used to, it was a, there was a, at least there would be some kind of a public display if people were involved in that because they would have to get out of their car and walk into a building where everybody could see them and then they'd, they'd be known. Now people just get away with it because it, Satan blinds their hearts and minds that they think that what they're doing just because no one else sees, they think that what they're doing is okay. Father sees. And the proverb says, and without America, the proverb says that he that enters into her door, her chamber goes down into, into hell. Because her, her door is a gates of hell. Go down to hell and there is no returning. I mean, just think about that tonight. If you don't deal with it now, all of the stronghold is going to do is it's going to get worse. It's just going to get worse. It's going to get worse. You say, well, I'll do it tomorrow. And no, tomorrow is going to come. It's going to get worse, and you're going to wake up in eternity without God. I know, I know of too many preachers and men of God who have gone down into hell 
And they've told us about what they've seen in hell. Well, I never thought I wanted to go to hell anyways. I just told people, well, listen, let's just go to heaven. You won't care about hell anyways. You just want to be there, right? I've always told the Lord, I want to just go to heaven and see heaven. I don't want to go to hell and see hell. But if that's what you need, I pray God's mercy upon you that you somehow tonight, Father's going to bend your will. Could that be possible that Papa would bend your will? I know how he bends your will. You know how Papa bends your will? He gives you over to destruction. That bends your will. It doesn't break your will. It doesn't change your will. It bends it. So that you might have an opportunity to wake up. You know? It's like the prodigal son. Where'd he wake up? Hmm? Eating, eating in the pig pen. The Lord bent his will. So what am I doing here? He came to his senses. Huh? If he would have been just partying, living luxury, luxuriously, he may never come to his senses. That's why people say, well, you, Mark says that there's going to be this judgment come upon America. He's like, God run out of grace. No. It's an act of grace. It's an act of mercy to bring people to their senses. God's going to judge America. Yes, he is. I'm telling you, Father's been warning America on a level that has not, that he never had warned America. Beginning in 1982, God began to cry, cry out, began to warn America on a, in a way beyond anything that had ever been said since America's existence. And he kept taking it up to another level, to another level, into the 90s. Took it to another level in the year 2000. Tonight, Father's calling you. I just want, I want everybody to leave out of here right. It's more important for me that you get authority and miracle power over sin than you have the manifestation and gifts of the Spirit in your life. It's more important that you get healed spiritually than, than you get healed in some kind of physical manifestation, some kind of physical way. Hallelujah. Borostakanea tipatai. Idaiyelo mosaparabai. Mambretete. Ambretesti. Ambretsusdetesti. Ebravo sukuriniapra. Urostoraniapratust. Urabastate. What's happening? Go ahead, just go ahead and share that. <clears throat> okay. <laughs> well, um, I just saw just now and, and also this morning when I was praying, you know, just for the church and, and I was calling out to the Lord for revival and he showed me that um, people are wearing glasses, basically. This is, I, I mean, I just see a picture and it's, glasses with a rainbow across the front. It's printed on the glasses and, um, you know, sort of like the phrase rose-colored glasses. And they're looking up at the sky and they're saying, Lord, we just want your promises and God, your goodness and your, your lavish, you know, grace. And, and all the while, it's fire. I mean, it's fire if you, if you just took off those glasses and saw what's really happening and the urgency of the immediate need to see what's really happening, and that is fire raining down. I mean, it is the wrath of God, and, and, and that, that is because people are unwilling to deal with the sin. I mean, there is sin. I'm, I'm like, <laughs> Sunday, Sunday night, I was like, feeling a move to vomit because there's sin in this house and there are people that are not willing to deal with it. I mean, do you think it's like casual that you can just walk in and walk out and not deal with these things? I mean, don't you think that God is just a little bit more sensitive? You think you're sensitive. You know, you flip on the TV and you see something, a commercial that offends your, your spirit. God is that much more sensitive to those things. And he's very sensitive to the things that you are tucking under the bed and not dealing with. And he says, it's now, you deal with it now, or maybe I won't even ask you about it again, and I'll be done with you. And it's just, people, it's like, I don't know what it's going to take for everyone in this place to just run up to the front and just say, Lord, 
Search me. I don't want anything that would offend you. Not anything, you know. I mean, come on, just raise the bar of holiness. It's not, I can't watch R-rated movies. It's, I'm not going to watch a cartoon if it has an attitude in it that would be offensive to my father. You know, just shut it down. Don't allow it. And it's not just movies. There's people in here, it's attitudes. And you think you're all good, but there's an attitude in your life, and you're allowing it. And it's just going to hold you back. You're never going to have those promises. You're going to stare at that rainbow, and you say, God, God, I, I, your promises, I, you said that I would do signs and wonders. Why not me? Why am I not? Well, you know what? Because you're not dealing with the problem. And just let your ears be open. It's like, <sighs> open your ears to what God is saying to you, not to the person next to you. Don't be thinking, oh, this is for someone else. Wow, that's a really good word for so-and-so, because they really, they need to deal with that problem. No, you need to deal with it. That's right. I need to deal with it. Things that I've allowed, and God, start with me. I mean, Father, I just fall on my face before you, and I just say, Father, search me. I don't want anything that would offend you. God, I just have to have your way and your will. It's not what I want. It's what you want, God. My life is not mine. It is hid in you, Lord. Would you just come and drench this place in your blood again? And, Father, forgive us. God, Father, forgive us. Give us another chance to see your glory. We have to have revival. And revival is not cheap. It's not easy. It requires fire. It requires a fire that will burn up every little thing that offends Father. Every little thing that offends him. So just run up here. What are you waiting for? Just run up here and get on your face because... Just don't even chance it, that it could be you that's holding back the revival in this place. Don't let that happen. Okay, just don't hold it back. Thank you, Father. just have to understand that what father wants what father wants is there's com father wants commitment he wants commitment because you can come up here and you can respond to the call of the lord that says listen i don't want sin in your life you know somebody says somebody could be watching or hearing say well you know i don't believe that the wrath of god is going to fall on anybody right now because it's deferred wrath look you don't know that you're going to wake up in the morning you could die in the next hour. No one knows what their appointed time is. And so ultimately, if you die in your sin, that's, ultimately, that's occurring wrath at that moment. And so if your loins are girded about, if your loins are girded about, the truth, if you got your belts on, as in other words, and you're ready to go, that means that everything is properly dealt with. You're, you, you're going to respond as though the wrath of God is right there pending upon you should you continue on in some kind of, of, of iniquity or practice of sin. So you're going to, in other words, I'm saying, you're going to have to make a commitment. If you've been involved with some of these things that have their entryway or their gateway through a computer or through an iPhone, smartphone, you need to get rid of the thing. You're not allowed to have it. And forget about, well, what if I put a protection on it? No, you don't need it. You did, people did fine with it in the 70s. Fine without it rather than the 70s. You'll do fine without it now. And even in the 80s. Get rid of it. There has to be commitment. Otherwise, you're just going you're to respond to the presence of the Lord. Then you're going to go out there and you're going to come under the influence of all that stuff out there. And, you're, and if you have not burned it. That's why in Acts, when they had a revival, they took their books. They took the things that were standing between them and God. And they made a, pot, and they made a bonfire. And they burned it. I say, okay, we're done with this. We're not passing by it anymore. We're not giving place to it anymore. That's what the Lord says when he says, come out from among them or come out, out, of, come out from among it and be separate from it. It has no place to access you. Whatever it is. Go ahead, babe. Go ahead. Okay, well, what was that? Tell me.
this is the future of her, what I do with her when I get out of heaven. And it started with the front row going down, down the rows, and it started looking at people from the slightest disagreement to the di differences. Uh, now go ahead. And you can go. I know it's from the Lord. It's going to be pretty intense for people. But I'm, I'm, I'm with you on sharing it. Listen, you're going to have to hear this. You're going to have to hear this in the right way. You don't want to hear it in the wrong way. Just hear it in the right way because it truly is. The Lord gives us dreams and he gives us visions. And, and so he gives them to us to share. And so this is something that happened quite some time ago. And tonight's the time to share it. So go ahead. Yeah, the other night I had this dream. And usually when I have dreams, it's either just something I keep between me and the Lord and ask God, okay, God, what is this? What do I do with this? Or I go to pastor and I share with him about just these different things. And I just feel so stirred to warn the church, to, to share this with the church. That we have been calling the fire of God into this church. Yeah, we have. And that is not ignored by God. No, it's not. He says, really? Is that really what you want? Yes. And we have been so desiring the fire of God because we want this place to be so pure, so reverential to allowing God to just have full reign in this place, to take full control of every area of our lives. And in this dream, Pastor Mark had turned the microphone over to Daniel and I to have us lead the church into intercession. And as Daniel and I, we turned our backs from the congregation and we started interceding to God for his presence and for his fire. A pillar of fire came down out of heaven at the, at the front of the church and started going down the rows, judging first the people in the front row to the next row to the next row. And anybody that had any slightest little disagreement, any sin going on in their life, anything that they weren't fully willing to commit over to God, he, it was like a tongue was coming out of the fire and licking them into the pillar and slowly going back, giving people a chance to run out of the door, people that didn't want to give up their sin, people right. that didn't want to commit. He was giving them a chance as he came down and people that were stubborn or hard-hearted saying it wasn't me, but then slowly would file out the door. He licked them up off of the stairs into his fire. And I woke up out of the dream and I said, God, what does this mean? What does this mean? And I fell back into his sleep. And he showed me as he cleaned up the house from what we had called, what we had desired. He came and he rested in such a manifested presence of his glory that there was nothing left except heaven, except his glory, except the presence of God. That the harvest could just see this light, this glory cloud in the place. People were so drawn to the place because all they could hear was the, the heavens worshiping in here and was bringing in. People were pouring into the place. But first it starts with us being cleaned up before we can bring in the harvest. First it takes us not allowing any seed of stubbornness or rebellion of sin of any kind whatsoever that we truly do deny ourselves and we give our life fully to Jesus Christ living only his way and his purposes all the way no middle ground no sharing part in this life part in that life that it all belongs to Jesus it is his life and nothing less than than that. Thank you, Jesus. Listen, I want you to understand something. This is what we, in the holiness Pentecostal movement that has been going on since the 1700s in its, in its, in its understanding and expression today, of course, it's been going on since the days of Jesus and before. We all agree that this is truth. It's only been in the past 40 years as there was the rise of the apostate church, that there's been a different opinion. Today, the Pentecostal movement is as much infiltrated and affected by the apost rise of the apostate church as any other church, as, as, any other, as any other group, because they've denied holiness. They've denied the blood that has bought them. What does that mean? They've denied the blood that purified them and made them holy, spotless, and cleansed from sin.
Because people say, oh, well, I didn't, deny the, I didn't deny the blood that bought me because I still believe the blood of Jesus cleanses from sin. No. You say that the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses from sin, but you're still a sinner. And thus, by that confession, you go ahead and practice sin, for you have no authority to stand against it. By your confession, you've asked Satan, or rather allowed Satan in. You must understand, people don't get this. People do not understand this. They, they, there has, it's almost as though uh, folks in this modern era and time, because they are completely removed, as it were, from the church that has existed since the days of Christ Jesus. They have no way to even relate to what we're saying. They have no relate, way to relate to what Charles Finney said in the Second Great Awakening. They have no way to relate to what, to what Jonathan Edwards said in the First Great Awakening. Sinners in the hands of an angry God. But this is how the moves of God came to the church. you got to understand, I truly, totally believe that this dream is from God. And, 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 and you got to understand, you got to recognize, you got to recognize that if you've done things wrong, repent. Father has made a way for us to be forgiven and cleansed. Don't be stubborn. Repent. Don't be full of pride. Pride is the worst thing that exists within the kingdom of darkness. Why? It's the most subtle power of deception among people. They want to go ahead and justify their state and not repent or just say that they can somehow like do it in secret and, and it's done. You know what? I've never seen anybody break free from a problem, a stronghold, repenting in secret. Never. It's open confession. Confess your faults one to another and pray over them. Somebody said, why don't you... You know, people ask me all the time, why don't you serve communion a lot? Because it's sacred, and people eat and drink damnation to their soul because they're blind of heart. And I, so I do communion only when the atmosphere is correct, when, people, when I can see, when I know I can look at people and say, you've repented, you, you, have you forgiven? I can examine them because I have to examine them because I'm not going to have somebody a cup to drink, eat, drink damnation to your soul. People don't even get that. People don't even, have a, people don't even have a way to even relate to those verses of Scripture uh, concerning communion. They don't even have, they have no context for it. That many are sick, can't get healed of their sickness, and, and, and sleep because of they, they drink and eat, they eat and drink unworthily. Wow, huh? I want you to grab this, and I want you to grab this, Okay. The Father is bringing everything that is hidden to light in this He's, place. It has to be. It is being revealed. It's going to be revealed. And then you can fall on your knees and you can cry out to God to forgive you and to have mercy. And you can ask God to shine his floodlight on your heart and to open it up to you so you can call out upon the Lord and repent. Or if you stay in this place, if you continue to walk in this place, and sit in this church, it's going to be brought to light because God's cleaning this house because there is going to be revival. It's time. It's past time. It is past time. And now is the time that it's all going to be dealt with. Right. And murmuring and complaining continually. There's people that have a spirit of murmuring, murmuring and complaining, and it's a religious type attitude that goes on in people where they get self-justified because I love Jesus. Right. And, you know, I love Jesus, and he's great, and I like everything, but I want him to come over here to my side and do it my way because I'm going to go over here. I'm not going to follow the Holy Spirit. You don't say that out loud, but that's what you do when you go off into your own, your own ideas, your own plans, your own murmuring and complaining. It's not following the Holy Ghost, what the Holy Ghost is doing, because the Holy Ghost is doing love, submission, obedience, and love does not do evil to its neighbor. Love does no evil, and the Holy Spirit's doing love. The Holy Spirit's doing love like Jesus did love, and he's, putting his, he's laying his life down, and he's dying on the cross. He's taking the stripes upon his back. He's doing love. He's serving his enemies. He's giving a cold drink of water to his enemies. He's not murmuring and complaining against them. And that thing has been strong in this place, the murmuring and complaining, or just your personal ideas about what the pastor's saying. Moses, Moses chose an Ethiopian woman. And Miriam and Aaron didn't like his personal choice. And they spoke against his personal choice, the man of God that God had raised up, that God had raised up. And I repent right now, Pastor Mark, for not always agreeing with everything. 
you know, having those times of where it's, and it's not like disagreeing, but it's having those times of question, what is this? We're not, we're not even to go into that realm, but we're to say, yes, Lord, reveal it to me because I surrender right. myself completely to the Holy Spirit it's a, it's and a, I'm following it's, it's the right. leader. And it's a different spirit. It's a different spirit to give yourself to endeavoring to keep the unity of the spirit and yes. bond of peace. See, the, you consecrated to being keeping the unity of the spirit and the bond of peace, even when you disagree or don't understand is the right dispos disposition and of the right spirit. Whereas the murmuring and complaining spirit, the Lord said, I'm not letting you come into my holy things. I'm not letting you come into my inheritance. He didn't say you can't come into my inheritance because of your fornication and your adultery, though it was grievous to the Lord. He said, you're not coming in because of your murmur and complaining. Read it, Hebrews right. chapter 3 and verse 4. He said, though the work, he said this, though the work was finished from the foundation of the earth, I swear in my wrath, you're not coming in. I'm, I, I, you're not gonna, you can't come in. Now, we have to understand that about Father because he's full of love, but he's just, he, he, there is a place. God gives everybody a space and time to repent. Understand that. But the wind will drive the chaff away. The wind will blow in here. The wind of God will blow. And that which is chaff. God is always separating. He's always dividing light from darkness, chaff from wheat, sheep from goat. He's doing it. He gives people a place. When the Lord told me not too long ago, he said, I said, Lord, what's going on? He said, I sh he said and he shall be loose for a little season. The Lord spoke to me, and he should be loose for a little season. And I said, Lord, well, what does that mean? He said, I give people a place to run to to practice their sin and their iniquity who rebel against me. And that's in the context now of folks living a thousand years under the reign of Jesus Christ and the reign, in the millennial reign, of his saints. The glory of God, Father's visitation, and yet Satan is loose for a little season. And the scripture says, more than the, than the number of the sand upon the seashores, run to that place that God allows folks to occupy if they want to rebel. Now you think about this. I'm, we're, I'm telling you the truth. And we're, we're letting you know what the Word of God says. And here's where we're at. And everybody knows this. The fire of God's falling in this place. And it's a beautiful thing for everybody who is right with God. It is not a beautiful thing for people who are not right with God. Okay? Now, I'm not talking about people young in the Lord. And I'm not talking about people who do not know the Lord. I'm talking about God's people who have called to be a part of the moving of the Spirit, who've had plenty and ample time to get it right, and they became stubborn and hard in their heart. Understand it. That's why we got you reading through the Bible right now. We want you to understand the way and the manner of the Lord. Okay? That's what we're referring to. I wanted, I, it's important for me that these distinctions are made. Are you with me? careful. You just obey the man of God. That's it. Because a thing of not understanding can lead into a lack of that unity of the spirit and bond of peace. And it can lead over into the realm of murmuring. And I, I don't want to go there. I don't want to be with none of it. And you don't either. The right spirit though. And let me just say this. I'm going to say this. The right spirit will always keep you lovely and speaking peaceable words and walking in humility. Humility is a great protection. The right spirit will keep you submitted and broken and lowly. The wrong spirit it should be a testimony that you're not right. But see, deception works such a way that people can't see it. Yes. Now just tell me. What's up? The Lord revealed to me today, even though I, I live a strict lifestyle, my thought life, my thought life, the Holy Spirit was sickened by my thought life. The Lord began to deal with me about the things that I thought because it was polluting no, that's, that's, very, that's good. That is, that's awesome that, that, you, that you heard that from the Lord. Because it's true. It, you know, when you look at where the battlefront is, my dear brother said the Lord just revealed to him that his thought life hasn't been right. He's lived a disciplined life physically, but his thought life hasn't been right. When you look at the battlefront in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, the battlefront is the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they're God power. I know King James says they're mighty in God, but it's literally God power. Theodunamis. It's God power. It's the power of God at work. 
for us, equipment that has been given to us, an authority to deal with ultimately the place where things can ult originate. Where are they going to originate? In the thought. In the thoughts. Is the thought sin? No. But it can become. Okay? Because Jesus was tempted in all ways which we are tempted, but was without sin. Okay? You can't be tempted without a thought. It's important to know that. But when it's just continuing, it's a place, it's a pattern in your life. It's got to be broken. Now, we're, we're asking, what God's doing is we're asking people to come into a holy fear tonight. We're asking people to come into a place. I'm asking husbands to be transparent with their wives. I'm asking wives to be transparent with their husbands. I'm asking, I'm asking uh, the, the children in here to be transparent with their parents. We're asking you to come. We're asking you to make commitments. We're asking you to consecrate things. What's up? It's true. That's powerful. It's powerful. This is true. That's the that's truth. That's the way it works. Veronica just said, if, peop, if you won't lay everything upon the altar, the fire of God can never burn upon your life. We're talking about the fire of God, the fire of the Holy Ghost. How, how did the, what was the offering all about? When the offering was holy and acceptable, what happened? Fire of God came down, showing what? That it was holy and acceptable. That it was an offering well pleasing unto the Lord. And he turned it from what? The natural to the heavenly. Yeah, from the seen to the unseen. Okay, I'm, I'm, I'm going to bring you to this. I'm going to bring you to this. You, if you had a piece of paper and a pencil right now, you'd have to write it. Because you're up here and you're saying, Lord, forgive me. But there has to be a commitment with it. I'm hearing this. There has to be a commitment with it. If whatever it is, it, it, I'm going to just tell you this. Yeah, if you and I'm going to break it down for you. Somebody said, oh, no, he's preaching from the clothesline now. Well, Fine. That's how all of the great revival I ever know happened. Pre people are preaching from the great, from the clothesline. And it isn't preaching from the clothesline. It's just honest and true, sincere. If you got HBO, Cinemax, and those kinds of movies, and you're paying for that stuff, and you're involved in that stuff, you need to go home and you need to cut that thing off before you need to even get home. You need to call up whoever the provider is and cut that thing off. Now you need to make a commitment. It's wrong. And you don't have a right to disagree with me because there's too much sin, and you know there's too much sin going on in that mess. Number two, if you've accessed or in, in, in any way participated with pornography through the Internet, currently participating with pornography, you are addicted in any way. It is an activity. In other words, it keeps coming around, comes around. Satan just lies in wait to deceive. He lies in wait. He just waits. He said, I don't have to pursue. I don't have to work too hard. I'll just wait till their moment of weakness. I pounce on them. They'll, I can make them. I can make them move to whatever my will is. If Satan believes he has the control over you, I'm gonna tell you right now, you want that broken. You don't want that. You don't want that attachment in your life. That's stronghold. That's stronghold. Now tonight, you're gonna have to say, no more, no more smartphone, no more iPad, no more computer, until. One day you can have that consecrated. If ever you, you, you you're not gonna have that with you in hell. Okay. Now, Allie, my daughter-in-law, she said she felt it Sunday night when the power of God was moved. She said I felt it, and the Lord began to show me different people who actually were involved in pornography in the meeting. She said I did. I just didn't feel like I should interrupt the flow that was going on at the time. And, and she was right. She's sensitive. She shouldn't. But tonight, this is it. So you're saying, Lord, forgive me. That's good. Lord, cleanse me. But he wants repentance. Father wants repentance. Those of you who have murmured and complained, those of you who have spoken against leadership, I don't care who they are, me, whoever, Benny Hinn, whoever, repent. Doesn't matter who. Repent. 
You need to repent publicly. You need to repent to the person. You need to write. If it's been him, write him a letter. Tell him, listen, I repent. I've spoken slanderous things against you. Or wherever, whoever. I mean, but more than that, you need to get right. You need to get right on a level. Say, look, you know what? I've had a wrong attitude. And I recognize that this thing has got to be broken because it's a stronghold and, and it's an action activity of demon power in my life. Father just wants everybody to confess and come clean so we can move on and have revival. Father just wants everybody to confess and come clean so we can move on now, and have revival. Now, what are you going to have to deal with? What, what, look, God's looking for valiant men and women. It's the... the, 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 the Look, the landscape of the battle is different now. It's not giant Philistines. It's demon spirits. What is the greatest power you're going to have to come up against to be able to do this, to repent and move on, come clean? Pride, the pride of life. And many people are held under its grasp and under its claw, and it dictates what you will do and what you will not do. It demands of your life. And the bottom line of it is, is you need to let the, let the Lord Jesus Christ... Begin to work in you brokenness. Because, I don't, listen, I don't care what you say. The pride of life is as evil as the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eye. And it operates more among God's people probably than any other thing. So we don't just get stuck on, we don't just get stuck on one dimension of, it's just that right now we see the big attack going on because it's just, it's just like when, it's when Balak brought Balaam to curse Israel. <laughs> I can't curse Israel. They blessed he said, but I can, tell you, I can tell you how to get them. I can tell you how to stumble them up. That's all you got to do. Get them involved in sexual immorality, and the Lord will depart. And, and the, plague will, the plague of wrath will burn in the midst. And, that's what, and so Satan is effective at his strategy. He's doing the same thing right now. Just as Balaam taught Balak to cast a stumbling block, so Satan has used his instruments today to cast the stumbling block and to create a terrible snare for the souls of men. Satan hunts the souls of men. Nimrod hunted the souls of men. The first Antichrist type in this, this, what we call dispensation or period of time. Nimrod hunted the souls of men. He is an antichrist. Antichrist will hunt the souls of men. Satan hunts the souls of men. Demon spirits hunt the souls of men, and he uses sin. He hunts them to destroy them, and he uses sin. And you have to wake up and recognize you're at war. So we're going we're gonna, to, we just, I want, you to, I, want you to, I want you to begin, I want you to just begin to move in this thing, man. I want you to just begin to move in this thing. I want you to just begin to, I mean, we're getting, we getting late here tonight, but fire God's here, presence God here, glory God's here. And what's most important for me is everybody to make consecrations in this place. You need to determine. You need to, you need to say between you and the Lord, here's what I'm going to do. I want you to just take a few minutes. I just want you to sit here before the Lord. Father, I thank you that your fire, like a cloud and like a pillar, will come down in this place. That your fire will burn in this place and everything that has hindered revival and everything that would stand in the way of that which is holy. That once again, the glory will be such that the Ananias and the Sapphires will fall down dead for lying about the offering. That once again, those who would hinder the moving and the advancement of the kingdom of God would go blind. That the great power and signs and wonders and demonstrations of God will be once again revealed so that those who are lost and have never heard the good news and have never heard the joyful sound that have never heard and had the opportunity to see how it, what, what it means to be born again, that they'll be able to see because all of the things that have hindered will be removed out of the way. That the truth of heaven, that there won't be false witness anymore, but the true witness. That your love will be seen instead of hate. Oh God, that your unity will be seen instead of strife. Oh God, that the glory of oneness will be seen instead of division. Oh God, that the, the beauty of togetherness and relationship, the way it's supposed to be, will be manifested in the midst of your people. There will be healing in the house and freedom in the house and deliverance in the house. Father, tonight I ask you by the spirit of the living God to imprint this on every person's heart and mind. Put this, oh God. Put Put your fear within the hearts. Put your fear. Put your fear in the hearts, oh God. 
of the people in this place. Put your fear in my heart. Put your fear in my heart. Now, I'm going to tell you something. Some of you have friends and family members around you that don't like me and they don't like this place. And they, when they start sowing seeds, you need to rebuke them and tell them to be quiet. You do. You need to. Because all it's going to do is be in your heart. And Satan uses it as a means by which to propagate his stronghold. Look, I don't care where it is. God's just looking for one single church anywhere where people are going to be willing to say, we're going to all come clean. Because it's just like he's done it time and time again. He's going to cause a fire to burn in that place that will change, that will touch the whole world. He's done it over and again. He did it in Jerusalem, and that's where the first model is. And you can see revival after revival, generation after generation, happen in the same way. And so Satan knows exactly what he's got to do to stop it. And it's time somebody get wisdom enough, because it hasn't nothing to do with human smarts get wisdom enough in the spirit to say no more am i going to be used as an instrument of hell to stop the advancement of the kingdom of god it's just that real it's just that simple it's just that much enlightenment it's that much of a gift of the spirit it's that much of an encounter with god when that begins to happen, reality will begin to shine like the noonday sun. It, that's far more than people just running after some flippant thing that they call the gift of the Spirit. When in reality, there has never been the purity that God demands for that glory to be made manifest. This is where we're going here. And this is where we're going. This is what God's doing. You've been served notice in a way, probably, and you never have in this church. There's some people here tonight, we could call you out by name and tell you what's going on in your life and what God wants you to do right now and what God is requiring of you. I, I just don't, I just don't have, I'm not fully released. Because if you won't hear God, the Holy Ghost, you will not hear me. Listen to me. Let's just separate ourselves unto the Lord. He separated us into himself. Let's just separate ourselves unto the Lord. Just consecrate ourselves to God. It's real simple. It's real easy. It's the good life. It's not the bad life. It's the happy life. It's not the sad life. It's the blessed life. It's not the cursed life. <laughs> it's the exciting life, not the boring life. Come on. It's life, not death. Hallelujah. I pray tonight in the name of Jesus that every one of you feel the glory of his own blood on you. His blood. His blood. I, feel you, I pray you feel the presence of his blood. I pray, I pray you feel the warmth of his, of his spirit. And very being. You have a reality. An encounter with God that's on the level. That you know that he's hearing. And he's listening. And that he's watching. And that he's calling. And that he's purposed. And that he will, and that he will reward. And that he will judge. <laughs> that you no longer halt between two opinions. You and I. Look. You and I have the privilege. We have the opportunity. To stand up. And move with God in our generation when nobody else is moving. Can you imagine being Eli and to lose everything on his watch? He lost everything on his watch. The glory departed on his watch. On his watch. Israel is totally brought into shambles. And what are you going to live for tonight? This is what God's been saying. He's been saying with such profound, such profound intensity for the past Two months. Amen. Things will, things, don't you expect things can, can, are going to continue on in your life as they've been? It's, and if you do, you're going to run the risk of allowing them. And then there's going to be a serious judgment for that. Scripture says this. It says, if we're judged of the Lord, then we're chastened of him so that we would not be condemned with the world. Isn't that beautiful? It's beautiful. 
All of his sons are chastens. Well, why don't we just go ahead and obey him and do it his way? Lord, we consecrate ourselves to live by your spirit, to walk in your spirit, to be led by the spirit, no longer to have it our own way, to do it your way, to reverence and respect your holy things. To hunger and thirst only after that which belongs to your righteousness. Lord, strengthen me in my body right now. That I might stand against sickness and disease. Strengthen me in my spirit. That I might stand against sin and iniquity. Strengthen me in my soul. That I would love only you. That I would desire only holy emotions. And those things, that are, those pleasures that are at your right hand. Lead me not into temptation. Lead me not into temptation. Deliver, me from evil. Deliver me from evil. For yours is the kingdom. For yours, is the kingdom. Yours, is the yours is the power. Forever. 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 Yours, is the yours is the glory. Forever. Forever. And that means now. That includes now. Husbands, do not allow your wives to murmur or complain. Rebuke them sharply. And then bring them. You need to bring them. And you need to, you need to submit the thing. And let's pray over it and let's break the yoke. Because it's demonic power. Because I believe that there's people who've never dealt with the reality. It's a stronghold. They've never de dealt with it. Because when, when Geneva was talking, the Lord began to point out several people to me. It, it's a demonic stronghold. It's, it's, it's prince is the pride of life. It's as evil as homosexuality. Or any other sin. It's prince is the pride of life. And it needs to be broken. It can't be hid anymore. It can't... It can't they can't live in dark places no more. So I'm, 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 I'm just really identifying even the more subtle things because I identified the more, you know, apparent, you know, gross apparent things like television, if it's a gateway. I watch television. I watch the Golf Channel. I, I don't watch commercials. We've got a way to turn this stuff off. I don't allow pollution to come into my spirit. I like watching football games. We don't watch halftime. We, we, we don't watch the commercials in between because it's full of lasciviousness. You know, and, and I've been concerned about it. Lord, am I being a wrong example here? Because, yeah, maybe I, can, maybe I have the spiritual growth and maturity to not watch the commercials to cut that stuff off. But if everybody else says, well, look, I, the pastor's doing it, I can do it, well, then that would be terrible. Okay? But, I mean, you know, just, I'm just telling you, I'm just being very transparent. You know, I, there's... We, we've, got, we've got to understand, however, that we can't have a liberty that was going to defile a weak brother's conscience because if we do, we're casting a stumbling block and be better than we not even entered into life. That's what Jesus said. That's the kind of sermons he preached. Everybody wants to be all religious about everything, but Jesus was really radical about everything. He said, did you do this? Things, it'd be better you didn't enter into life. Okay? The altar is a very holy time. It's a very special time to the Father. This, what's going on right now is the most sacred thing that goes on the Father. Everybody needs to recognize that. There has, to come a, there has to come another level of reverence in the house of God. And the Holy Spirit is here to give you that insight if you're willing to listen. But if you're involved in a bunch of stuff, you won't even be able to hear it, won't be able to be sensitive to it, won't understand it. It'll be just as common and ordinary sitting in your living room or shopping in the grocery store. And it ain't. Okay? So it's just, we just want, we want Father to give us this insight. That's all. We, I, we want to be a part of revival. We want to be a part of the great moving of the Spirit of the Lord. Not for some ego purpose, but for the kingdom of God purpose. Because I'm happy, I'm happy no one ever knowing my name so long as they know his name. That's all I'm interested in. I'm, I want to be just right in the big middle of the fire of God so the, the brightness of his glory is burning so bright no one can see anything but the fire anyways. 
<laughs> Amen. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Rabaste. 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 Rabasto sitiete. Rabo security. Ramondokini. If your heart's not right with Jesus, you can, you can get right right now. If your heart's not right with the Lord Jesus, you can get right right now. If your heart's not right with Jesus, it will be manifested in the deeds and the conduct of your life. Somebody says, God knows my heart. Yeah, and I tell you right now, I know your heart too by the conducts and deeds of your life. If the conducts and deeds of your life are not right with God, your heart's not right with God, so get your heart right. See, it would be condemnation if we were saying you, that your heart's not right with God and just leaving you there. But we're saying your heart's, if your heart's not right with God, get right with God. That's not condemnation. That's just a call. Amen. Listen, if something's been going on in your life that's caused damage, collateral damage around you, if you've lost kids over this and you, and you haven't repented over it, look, you losing your kids to the kingdom of God is a strong witness of your wrongdoing. And if you get right and repent, they'll come back. But if you hold on, harbor sin, and act like you didn't do anything wrong, then not only are they not coming back, you're not right with God. There's a lot of people going to wake up in hell. Believe, truly believe that they're right. They're going to wake up in hell. They violated things of the anointing. If you read the Bible enough, you'll recognize you cannot violate things of the anointing and be right with God. It scares people to read the Old Testament. That's why they don't read it. I love reading the Old Testament because it reveals Father to me. I know exactly how he feels about things, and it puts holy fear in my spirit. Amen. Amen. Jesus. Come then. The, um, the prodigal son in Luke 15, he had the revelation. It, you know, it says when he came to himself. And that revelation was first and foremost, that I have sinned against heaven. Mm -hmm. In Job 33, starting with verse 27, it says, He looketh upon men, and if any say, I have sinned and perverted that which was right, and it profited me not, he will deliver his soul from going into the pit, yep. and his life shall see the light. Lo, all these things worketh God oftentimes with man. Oftentimes with man. To bring back his soul from the pit. To bring back his soul from the pit. To be enlightened with the light of the living. To be enlightened with the light of the living. Listen, you must understand, this is the Spirit of the Lord. Everybody who has the Spirit of the Lord pleads in the same way. Most people respond just like Israel did in the book of Joshua and Judges. Who are you? What spirit of you? What spirit are you of? You have to decide that. The response of your heart tonight reveals a lot of it. Where you're at with God right now reveals a lot of it. What you're willing to do, what you're willing to confess, whether or not you're willing to justify yourself and say, well, I was right in what I thought. No, you weren't. If you just by saying that, you threw off conviction. Just by saying it, if you were wise, you'd have recognized, oh my, I just threw off conviction. I truly believe this, and I'm going to close with this. And you go home with this tonight. I truly believe that the fire of God is about to burn in this place. Father's fire and his wind has always been in this place. Always. And that's why a lot of folks just can't stay around. But Father's going to take it to another level where people who've been able to stay around and wanted to stay around because they wanted to be a part, but they've not willing, been willing to conform. I'm telling you, believe me. It's going to make a difference. 
His fire will stand, his fire will create darkness for those who are his enemies and will be a light for those who desire to follow him. That's the way it is. We're just often, God often pleads with men to deliver their soul from the pit. So we're praying and petitioning you with all holiness and with fear. I mean, the way Peter preached it, <clears throat> seeing as these things shall all burn up with a fervent heat, they shall dissolve with a fervent heat. What manner of conversation or lifestyle living should you have in all holiness and right. righteousness and godly fear? Hey? hey? Amen. Amen. I said there's a fiery prayer that God wants to develop in your spirit. You're crying out that God wants to put in your heart. Yes. You need to let him. You, you let your silence be turned into a roar of petition before the Lord, okay? Amen. And just start right there in your home, in the privacy of your house. Just let your silence be turned into a roar of a prayer and petition. And you'll begin to find something. You'll begin to find that. You'll begin to find a strength that will change things. Amen. Hallelujah. The Lord's so serious about it. He says, if your eye offend you, pluck it out. If your right hand offend you, pluck it out. Cut it off. If your foot offend you, cut it off. He says, I want you to get serious about repentance. I want you to get serious about living right and walking right. Let's just do it. Let's just do it and watch what God will do.
is what it comes down to. For the majority, what God is addressing is people have been here for more than 10 years. And you're going to have to just understand it. You're going to have to deal with it because your problem isn't with me, it's with God. You just have to understand that. That's what the Father is, is pleading for you to understand. Keep doing that. We love you. God loves you. God loves the whole world. He gave his only begotten son. He pleads with you. Somebody said, you know what? You know, there's people used to, I've had preachers say to me, and I'm, you know, and there's some people here, and I'm going to say this. I've said this in the last couple of years here tonight. I've had ministers come to me and say, you need to tell them I'm out of the church. They're not supposed to be. They shouldn't even be here. And I go, no, I, I know you. I hear that. I love you. I respect you. But look, I'm a pastor, and I know the meetings of God. And I don't ever do that unless God the Holy Ghost pushes me to do it. And so you're gonna have to you're gonna have to you're gonna have to deal with yourself. You're gonna have to deal with things that you said. You're gonna have to deal with things you said to decide that you can take it against the Holy Ghost. And you can't take a side against the Holy Ghost and then act like it's no big deal. This is what God loves like, oh, this is God's mercy. I have sinned against you, sinned against you. No, 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 no. I'm talking just applied scripture. person themselves deal with this okay this is what I'm I just I'm pleading with you because now I'm released the Lord just released me okay I'm pleading with you did you hear did you hear what Pastor Ann said did you hear it I might have to have her read it again because it is a direct word from heaven to you it is a direct word from heaven to me I'm never going to escape the spotlight to meetings like this and to say it's everybody else. It's a direct word of heaven to me. You better understand these are direct words of heaven to you. It's not your brother, it's not your sister, but it's me, O oh Lord. Are you with me? One more time, baby. Just read Job one more time. It's Job 33, 27 through 30. He looketh upon men, and if any say, I have sinned, and perverted that which was right, and it profited me not. He will deliver his soul from going into the pit, and his life shall see the light. Lo, all these things worketh God oftentimes with man, to bring back his soul from the pit, to be enlightened with the light of the living. question if it's even a question get right get right amen we love all of you make sure that you hug people tell them that you love them that you're praying for them that we're going to get this thing right that we're praying for each other that we're going to get this thing right okay god's going to have full reign and rule over our lives okay Okay, hold up, hold up, hold up, hold up. And give me this. And give me this. Give me that. Okay. Pastor Daniel says he wants to collect electronics. For those who've had problems, he wants to collect. And I agree with that. Just those who've had problems, come on. Anybody else? Anybody else? Anybody else? Those of you that he's collecting electronics from, I want you to spend some time with Daniel. Let's understand how to go forward because it's not just smartphones, it's iPads, it's computers. Anyone else? Anyone else? This is time to come clean. You know, I'm going to move with this. I'm going to move with this. I'm going to move with this. I'm going to move with it. I'm going to move with it. I'm going to move with it. It's time to come clean. It's time to come clean. It's time to come clean. Because if you understood that this very act is breaking the thing, 
It's breaking it. It is an act of consecration. It's breaking it. One of the beautiful things about Carlos and his ministry, yeah, he had power over principalities and, and, and spiritual wickedness that held cities in, in strongholds, but he would take people into the tents that were delivered, and he would say, look, where are things going on in your life? These doors have got to be shut because this is what's really going to be closure on this demonic activity. It doesn't matter where a person's at. There has to be an act of consecration that says, we're breaking this thing off. There has to be a confession. A confession. How many of you know you can't just confess to yourself? <laughs> That's right. Has to be a confession. Amen. If there's reoccurring sin, you need to name the sin. If there's violations against the anointing, you need to name the sin. You need to name it. Name it. I want you to name it right now. You name it. Name it. Name it out loud. You don't need to get to whisper it, but just name it. Name the thing. If there's not going anything going on, then don't name it. I mean, you don't have nothing to name. But if there's something going on, if it's a reoccurring thing, you name it and you renounce it. Amen. Renounce it right now. I hear the Spirit of the Lord saying, renounce it right now. Ask him to strengthen you so that it never happens again, that you have wisdom and insight to stand against it. Look, we ask the blood of Jesus Christ to cleanse us, but we ask the Holy Spirit to empower us with the ability to stand against it. It has to be both. It has to be both. It's the blood and the Spirit. It's the blood that cleanses and the Holy Ghost that empowers us not to do it again. This night, this night goes down for you in the, in the annals of your eternity. I just want you to know, this goes down in the log or the diary of your eternity. Tonight. For good or for bad. For blessings or for curses. For breakthroughs, in other words, or for still, or for imprisonment. Father gives an opportunity, pleads with men to draw them back, to bring them back, to deliver them from the pit. Your soul is upon the slave block of eternity. Going once, going twice, going three times. Sold to the self, to sin, or to God. Each one of us, Father, has given us that place, that right to decide. Wow. Let's choose to serve the Lord. Amen.